Uh, I never played uh, Guillotine. Wait. We're, I, okay, so I... Yeah. Was it a board game? No, yeah. Guillotine was a card game. I, uh, I fucking kind of do. We're, we're, okay, man, so... I've seen familiar. it. I've never played yeah. it, though. It sounds good. Okay, familiar. so I think... I think... Uh, if I had to think of a first time... Oh, uh, I think I've just seen it because I worked at a board game store and I used to look at yeah. it. I don't, think, I don't think I've actually played it, but I've definitely seen it. If I think of a first time for this, it's always been uh, drinking a lot. Oh, good Lord. Uh, man, my folks made a lot of that uh our family has addictive tendency shit clear like and correct across the board uh and fucking for some reason a part of my brain just completely activates if there is a group activity and alcohol although it's been less karaoke uh, in recent times for obvious fucking reasons Hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Perez. Uh, this is the Pig Iron Podcast. Uh, this is me and uh, the the boys tonight. Basically, we have buddy number one, Jake. We have buddy number two, Ruben. Uh, we we are a, fucking. We have a bird, buddy. Is that a bird in your? Is there a bird somewhere? Is there a distant bird? It's distant. Okay. One second. No, it's uh, fine. Like, I mean, you know, we can roll with it. I don't think the bird's going to stick around forever. But speaking of buddies. <laughs> it's getting farther away, I guess. That's a close yeah. word. If you, well, I guess you wouldn't be able to hear it as much because it's not. If it's, pod. If, it's, if it's on your head, you pod. won't hear it in your headphones. Okay. Oh, there's the, the bird. There's just back. Swallow. <laughs> okay, i got to shut the window. Hold on, yeah. Like, take your headphones off and see if you hear it to, to start. Cause oh, my maybe God. Go, maybe yes. get those. Yes. Maybe take oh, us to the window. We're rolling I, with this. I don't think it's Ruben, and I don't think it's me. I'm oh pretty my sure god. So what you're hearing is five of them. Oh, oh wow. Nice. Hell oh, yeah. God. It's like a Are Disney they related? Movie. Wait, Michelle, yeah, Michelle, wait. Holy yeah, give us shit. You have to visualize this for us. Are they is it a movie? Is it a I don't think Michelle like, can hear us. Is it a mama bear and babies? <laughs> That's not how birds work, Jake. They're birds. birds There's a mama bird. There's the smaller baby birds. Okay, They're completely whatever. different dynamic. They're not bears. Oh, They're wow. not bears, hey, Jake. They're birds. Dickhead. Holy shit, man. Get it together. You're the producer. I look to you. I'm, I'm <laughs> frazzled right now. When birds spend Thank the first three months think... of their life being bears. They would never be a bear, Jake. Tragic. It's so simple. Bears Tragic. are never in eggs. Oh my god. They, they say this all the fucking time. This is they one of those classic examples porridge. where it's very clear what I mean, and you instead get very hung up on a particular word choice. They don't go for walks. They don't uh, go for walks. They don't they lock do their not, doors. They do not go after picnic baskets, Jake. Forage game, weak. Table game, weak. They can't do it. Bed game, weak. They can't do it. Um, I'm not birds. fighting this. I'm not fighting G- this. Guillotine is a... Uh, you can't. Guillotine is basically a game that's two to five people. There's sort of a lineup. And uh, the description, (laughs) I'm looking at BoardGameGeek.com. It it goes as follows. The French Revolution is famous in part for the use of the guillotine to put nobles to death. And this is the macabre subject of this light card game. There's executioners pandering to the masses. The players are trying to behead the least popular nobles. Each day, the nobles are lined up, and players take turns killing the ones at the front of the line until all nobles are gone. However, players are given cards which will manipulate the line order before harvesting, which is what makes the game interesting. After three days' worth of chopping, the highest total carries the day. So yeah, basically, uh, there was sort of a weird interplay between players because, yeah, they shape. They'd like they'd share and well not share necessarily, but they'd look at sort of outcomes of someone's decision making while being drunk, mind you. I don't think I've ever had anyone do a sober playthrough of guillotine. Uh, right. Generally, generally game night is is very. Uh, I don't know. People do feel 
weirdly attached to the need to do like adult vices or whatever. I don't think it's yeah. bad if you do a board night sober, but I'd say in your early to mid twenties, what's going to happen? I'm sorry. That said, um, yeah, tonight's focus is that of the game night. Um, I think another experience I'd had was with a friend I played guillotine with in both uh, Washington and later Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and, yeah, he introduced me to Magic the Gathering. I started playing it, and I'd go to drafts. I'd never do anything competitive because while I was okay at uh, playing at a locale called the Wandering Goat, uh, like, I, have I was... The, I have the gaming I, goat. Yeah, the Wandering Goat was a coffee, and, you know, you could get a beer to fun type fact. bar. I got a fun fact. Mm -hmm. so, I'm staring at the location, the Wandering Goat, on a poster I have from a band who did a tour in the Northwest. They played at the Wandering Goat. Yeah, no, they they were also a music venue. There you go. And so you would be sitting at, you'd be sitting at a table in this bar, while maybe someone is doing some weird doom shit, they're playing Magic the Gathering. Uh, not all the time. They clear out tables for bigger events because that fucking makes sense. But no, that's that's Oregon in a Eugene, nutshell. Eugene, Oregon, that's just shit that happened there regularly. I've been told the place, I've been told the Wandering Goat shut down recently, and it fucking bums me out. Probably true for all I, I think know. it's probably temp, though, because, like, that's a prime location in the city. To say no one's ever going to use it again is a bit silly. I just hope it isn't, like, a fucking, I don't know, like, taco chain place. That would suck ass. Uh, but, yeah, <laughs> in terms of, in terms of, like, the board game night, like... Do you guys feel you have similar experiences, differing experiences? And if so, fucking let me know. Oh, I well, think I'm, I am I wanted to do this episode because I know that Ruben and I have very different experiences. Yeah, we're on very different ends of the spectrum there. Yeah. But you were talking I, about Michelle. Oh, it's a spectrum, folks. <laughs> we were talking about Michelle that uh, you had learned about the gathering, had some time with that, but never gone competitive. Jake, do you have any experience with competitive Magic the Gathering? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can get we can we can get right into this, I guess, because like <laughs> it's relevant to the entire rest of the episode. Um, we wanted to talk about board game night nights, folks. We're all geeks on this show. We needed a light. We needed Not a relatively cool. light subject this week. I'm and normal. Ruben, um, as we'll get into it, Ruben is sort of what I consider to be one of those people that like is just a smart and good resource when it comes to the world of board games. I know he's got a lot of experience learning and playing them. So for those who have an interest in that kind of thing, which I feel like might be a significant chunk of our audience, and in general, if you either like board games or you like listening to us ramble, this will be the episode for that. Um, here's Jake's Magic Corner. Playing Magic the Gathering, is it cool? Is it a fun activity? Uh, the answer is absolutely like yes for at least a little bit it's a very cool game i think learning it is you know on some level a very good educational experience that you can have as both a kid or an adult with regards to just like uh learning a system and that sounds like kind of like nerdy or broad but when you learn to play magic at the end of the day you're just learning like rules of a game because you're going to do the same thing over and over and over again. Like playing Monopoly or playing Life, or playing some other board game, you're going to do this with your friends once every couple of months, maybe. You're going to do this not that often. You're going to stop thinking about it when you're done with it. When you learn to play Magic, if you're really into it, it will start to become a thing that occupies your mind more often than not. And I assume this happens with board games on some level, but like I don't know how many people most of the people I know who play board games, who I consider board gamers, they go from game to game to game to game. And I think they have a central understanding of like board game mechanics yeah. and how those can translate from one to another and how like card drafting works or how like grand, like I don't know a lot about other stuff like dice game mechanics and stuff like that. But magic players, they, they play magic a lot, a whole lot. So when I learned to play magic, I was like very interested in it from this competitive angle. 
I had this idea that was super cool of like, oh, isn't it sweet to go into a place and put five bucks down and play against people and try to win some money? And what I learned is that, A, for me, that is very fun. But B, those are very specific types of magic players, right? So <laughs> this is where this is where Magic Corner becomes relevant to board gaming. Those magic players, they start to become people, like the way you start to think about magic when you're playing it competitively when the goal is to win is simply what do I do to, to kill my opponent? Like a lot of times pet decks or like the desire to play like a cool combo brew or the desire to come up with something that is creative uh, usually just goes away right? That becomes irrelevant. What you become is someone who analyzes a field of players and analyzes a field of archetypes. You break down your meta. You start to become a guy who like thinks about random choices for your sideboard, which is like the 15 cards in Magic the Gathering. When you play it competitively, you ha- it like matters what cards you bring to the table, right? It's not just casual. These shits are expensive and a lot of times you'll only need like one or two for what's called the sideboard, which is the thing that affects how you play in between games. And you'll just end up with like 30 or 40 magic cards that could be of your potential 15. And you're like thinking constantly about which ones to bring this weekend to the tournament because this deck is going to be better or this deck's going to be better. It becomes very fun, but also very all consuming. And I know a lot of magic players for which there's like that's, they don't do like other video games. They don't really play they'll play other board games for fun but it honestly looks more like uh just look like it starts to look like professional poker players yes uh, showing up and it's just like you know these people you know what they do you yep. need to center yourself around how to play against these people yes you become a part of a community for better or worse and it's it's you know i was a part of that community yeah, for a enemies. long time you have enemies you have rivals it's it can be as much like a sports anime as you want it to be honestly that's all mental faith frankly like um and to be clear like i was pretty privileged to be in a in a city seattle where the scene for this game is enormous the market interests are in here from a casual to a competitive perspective is enormous the people that make the game make it fucking 20 miles down the road in renton i don't know if that's accurate 20 maybe less than 20 i'm not good at my geography around here however um the I guess like what side effect of that is that and to be clear here i'm talking about playing magic like like try hardy when when the the majority of people who play magic are going to learn the game and probably play what's called commander which is where you make these big decks full of one card each you can't have more than one copy of a card and you play multiplayer and that's actually honestly to be clear that's much more akin to a typical board game experience i won't talk much about it because it's not something i do very often but um, I think you learn a lot of different lessons playing something like Commander than you do playing competitive Magic. It's 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 an inherently political thing where you're playing with like six people, so you have to say, "Hey, don't attack me, attack that guy." Stuff that would never ever ever come up in a competitive environment. Um, in fucking Mario Party, it's skill based games. Yeah, you know that dog shit for casuals. It, it, it that it's is isn't a children's game, right? And that's five hundred dollar rifle I brought. And even in the <laughs> even in that. Even in that community, Commander, there's like this entire swath of people who, like to me, it's it's a very difficult thing to imagine wanting to play because here I have my deck that I made and it it does this X, Y, or Z thing. And like, let's say I just roll it to a random group of people and I happen to have a really good draw and I win on like the third or fourth turn. People go, oh, that's not very fun. Your deck is too try hard. You build it. And you're like, well, what, am I, what am I supposed to do? Like not win? And then there's people who are obsessed with building the most competitive decks that are like, oh yeah, like all of our games are done before the third or fourth or fifth turn. And like, we're all trying to combo out on game one. And like, you know what? Bless those people. That's fine. Um, That's usually where the competitive players will end up. If they get bored of competitive magic, they'll go, I'm going to go play a competitive variant of the casual magic formats. Um, But what I noticed about playing magic like that and what I've, like the reason I even brought it to board game night is that, um, in the kindest way possible, it <laughs> turned me into socially a total prick to play games with on board nights. Um, it you is, in. It you is just some... bringing nukes to the fucking board. It's and it... uh, you're dead in three. So everyone, if you just walk away, we're actually done here. And it's something that I think is 
I, I don't want to. I don't want to say like every single Magic player is like this, but I, well, here's what I'll say. Like I like I mentioned, Seattle's super fucking popular for this game. When I went to tournaments and like locals, when I went to like locals, the people I would be playing against were super nice and all, but they, but they were like categorically extremely good at Magic: The Gathering. There used to be these large tournaments called Day, Grand Prix. And frequently, all of the people that beat me at these locals were people that were getting, like, day two of the Grand Prix and then, like, breaking into top 32s or, like, even getting top eights. Um, even we've had locals win Grand Prix. Like, Seattle's <laughs> an extremely strong area for, uh, like, Jake, tournaments. Yeah. Folks, to put things in perspective, Jake has had his eyes closed for four whole minutes recounting all of this. You're fucking, you need to chill out. It's Jake fantastic. Out. He's no, good, he, he's going uh, into the mind palace. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, to, it's I, great I, seeing you excited. In the zone. He's in the zone. I'm Four seeing minutes. How the, I'm seeing how the beast makes its bread. Yeah. <laughs> so like the fucking board game, no cardboard. War this is this is how out. the bear flies. We're playing Catan, huh? I, like all right. I, I, I hand to God, like other Seattle people can attest to this. It's not like I'm not making this shit up. You went I to used Carcassonne to, night and you put everyone in a fucking grave. I would go to a Monday night tournament. And I, I would see, I would like play against a guy and I would be like, oh, cool. I like beat this guy. He's really good. And then I would check, you know, the Magic the Gathering tournament reports later that week. And it would be like, oh, yeah, there's a Grand Prix in Spain. Let me go check who went top it. Oh, it's Patrick, the guy I played on Monday. He's just fucking there. And he just went and top it. He's really, really good at this game. It's insane that I beat him once. You know, shit like that would happen. Um because we have like a lot of, again, a lot of these people are like software devs. They make a really decent living. They can afford to travel on weekends to those bigger tournaments that used to happen pre-pandemic. And yeah, it just so happened that I, I would be in locals with all of these like sharks, frankly. And it's a way to get really good at the game if you want. Like you can either get, you can either get frustrated and stop playing or you can go, oh man, like how, how do I get better? How do I beat these Free fools? Tech. How do I, how do I hang with the big boys, right? Like what, frankly, what beats, like, what beats the $10,000 decks? I mean, it's all ten thousand dollar decks. It's all. It's all. I mean, there's the low cap entry is like two two thousand dollars. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, when you're playing at that level, um, especially like, and I'll say one thing: like as expensive as the hobby is, access was almost never an issue for me because of the community aspect, and that's a whole separate thing entirely. But um, I just want to give a shout out to like the existence of a community that will essentially willingly lend each other thousands and thousands of dollars of, of cardboard over the course of like stuff you know for what for whatever and more often than not it's usually on good faith that these people will take your really expensive magic cards and play with them and give them back to you um and obviously sometimes collateral is involved too but yeah it's 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 you know if i wanted to play the ten thousand dollar deck and i didn't have it i could go hey which one of you motherfuckers has it can i borrow it for this tournament and more than likely i could find it right um so that was like a very cool experience. But the thing about, again, to bring it back to the board game night thing, once I started being someone who really understood magic, and to be clear, I started commentating local matches. So I became very involved in understanding how the game works on a fundamental level. Not like, um, oh, like this card's powerful because it just got printed and it's new and everyone's playing. Like understanding the core engine that is Magic the Gathering and what is good against like what is good for the rules what is bad for the rules and so my point here is that once you get to that level as a player and many 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 people are i'm not unique i'm not that good i just happened to crack at it for like maybe three years or four years and that this is the result of that um it starts to apply to most other game rules and games that you that you see and that's what i mean when it started to make me an asshole at game nights uh the moment i started playing like i used to play Catan, right and i would like i would i'd would be fine but like yeah, not it'd be fine you know break. maybe one once or twice really always liked getting longest road i can totally remember the several times that i played Catan. like after i started being a tournament magic player i'd go to local or like, like friends parties or uh you know catching up with people and we'd have some beers and break out the board game <laughs> and like i just remember it, it, like the best way to describe it is that like when you go to a magic tournament and you're seeing all the same people you're around all of this similar behavior um it's it doesn't stand out for you to act like a fucking weird 
a competitive asshole because everyone in the room is doing that. So you're all sitting there in silence. You're all like really mulling your decisions. You're all tanking. You're all like staring and flipping your cards constantly. I can give you guys an example of that in a second. Um, but uh, everyone respects that, right? Like everyone is there and everyone's like understands that you're doing this process. When you, bring that mentality, the blows. when you bring that mentality to board night, uh, <laughs> you quickly realize you're a fucking freak. <laughs> oh yeah no man you very quickly realize that it, you will you'll start to alienate other people with because your desire to win is overriding um your ability to be nice you're carving your name correct fucking very correct <laughs> you're fucking, very correct you're a fucking animal you're a loose animal um, up in your fucking cage and you i think play carcassonne real quick you want to castle block you fucking idiots four times learn how to play dipshits you see so that shit? Play, he's he lost just, 12 points. He just like Dumbass. takes a revolver out. He spins <laughs> a single cartridge into six chambers that like spins, snaps it back in his hand, and then places it on the table. <laughs> it's awful. I mean, <laughs> folks, you can hear it in Michelle's voice. I, you sh I can attest that she has experienced this when we've played competitive games together. Um, uh, Jake, Jake, um... Historically, Ruben has been shot caller in any situations we've been playing. Um, if you get both Jake and Ruben on the same team, they're trying to outcompete each other the entire Twin fucking snakes. time. Twin snakes. Twin, Twin snakes. There's a liquid. There's a solid. Brother. Brother. I say, yeah, I would say more often than not, we're we're pretty good allies. If anyone, I, I for, if you want an analog, uh, a recent film I'd seen. Jake has seen an excerpt of it called RRR. Uh, there is a scene in the film where a man's knees get bashed in so badly that he cannot walk. But his homie, uh, the very strong actor, piggybacks him on his shoulders. What follows is they become one big mecha guy and they start doing john woo moves at everyone <laughs> yeah when we this is basically us playing fortnite yeah at our i best. won't focus solely on fortnite but we've done pve games also and uh they're constantly trying to shot call at the same time it's really intense to watch holy shit it depends on the game i think we can gel pretty pretty nicely the helical uh, relationship yeah, yeah, as long yeah. as we don't, if I don't have any active qualms about game design that I need you to hear about right now, <laughs> then we can usually have a pretty okay time. Yeah, but I love if, it. Like, that's the thing is like, it up. took me, I would say like, because we all used to play games back in the day. And I'm talking to when we were like teenagers and I was not that person back then. I didn't really have the hunger. I kind of wanted it and I kind of didn't understand how to get it. Because that, that, that describes my, wanna feel it. my whole flirting with fighting games growing up was like, I wanted to be a good fighting game player, but I really didn't understand how. A lot of a lot of things about being competitive, I just didn't grasp. And where I learned all of those things was Magic the Gathering, playing the tournaments and playing how, a competitive circuit. How to be toxic. I, I mean, how to shit talk how, nonstop. How to be mo, like? Mo. I, I would say how to like take the how to avoid being toxic while still uh, getting value out of like fucking. Um, confidence i guess like you know like but it is a line it's really a line to toe for sure mm -hmm. um because I, I it's not like <laughs> like i want to say that like in the seattle scene for sure we had a lot of really 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 good people as magic players who were really like all these good magic players i was describing mostly for the good people but not all of them um a lot of good magic players like fundamentally excellent magic players are people who i did not personally enjoy being around at all so Yes, like you don't have to be a nice guy to win. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, and so, like again, this is like I really wanted to bring this up at some point during the episode, and in the beginning, it's just fine because board game nights, man. It's really more about. It should be in in a, in a lot of ways more about the people and not about the board games. And I kind of socializing. I, yeah, and that's going to be more of like Ruben's specialty here, but. I, I really do. There was a period of time where I remember, like, I think playing again, like Catan with some friends and just like refusing to trade something because I knew I was in a like ex excellent position and like making enemies of everybody. And it was like super fun for me and whatever. But also, like, uh, 
I definitely got like ribbed for it in a way that I was just like, you motherfuckers <laughs> do not oh. understand. Oh yeah. I, I want to say, um, before we, we sort of leap into, to Ruben, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other night, uh, and you actually came up Ruben. Uh, and then I kind of talked to you about it, uh, recently in the air quotes behind the scenes chat we do when we coordinate stuff making the show um but i thought about this when uh, a a co-worker of mine was talking about running tabletop stuff for members of his family one i think doing tabletop with your family sounds like a fucking dicey proposition like like if you're doing like a pen and paper game for example fuck that noise Good God. I mean, it could be cool. My mom has actually played D&D, but that aside, like, for me, uh, that just sounds mind-blowing. And I I kind of talked about uh, pen and paper games that Ruben has run. He's run quite a few in our friend group. And so, I don't know. I think a lot of people are sort of what they do repeatedly. So... I've thought about this after him doing enough stories and like doing outlines. I think if there's, if there is a nice thing I could say of like air quotes, geek discipline, it would be like, okay, so a dungeon master, if they're able to do like a good campaign where people say like, it didn't suck beginning to end, that person is like an actual capable storyteller. Like, like I'd say uh, that person would have like as much a grasp of uh, a uh, beginning to end narrative as someone that like does a media thing with my narrative. I think the confines change here, but like uh, to do a thing beginning to end, uh, while it is on a entire, entirely tiny small scale, the difference between that and zines is like maybe two digits. Um, so like you, you're playing with like three to four people or whatever. Like sometimes. Fuck, that's an entire zine's leadership. No, totally, yeah. So, like, I always find it interesting, like, what people gravitate to also. Like, a lot of people uh, in their creative fields, they'll glom onto something. It'll be, like, consumption of X thing so they can be a buff in it Mm -hmm. or have a specific take within that field. Uh... Some people are like an all of the above person. Some people position it as a social media thing. Like, you know, God, we're losing. We not enough time in in the day to talk about all of the geek brands. So many fucking brands, dog. It's all brands all the fucking way down, which whatever, make your money. But I I guess Christ on a cracker. I guess another relevant thing about this in general is that, like, I mean, I'm talking about Magic the Gathering, you're talking about Dungeons and Dragons. All this shit is bizarrely more popular than it has ever been. Um, you know, maybe not bizarrely, but I think concurrently with the rising in geek interest that we've all witnessed over the last two decades. Guess, um, what, guess what continuously continue, like outsells? Like, Magic, I think almost every time they put out a new set, it is their best selling set, which is insane. There's more product now, like physical product, than, than, than there historically ever has been. I mean, it's the flip side of that one coin where if society moves in a certain way, then there's going to be uh, kind of bellwethers of what that looks like. Right. Uh, so Also, concurrently, like, board games have risen with that too, right? Like, we've seen more and more types of um like nerd bars open up or bars that encourage people to come and play a board game and have beer and shit like that i mean oh yeah it's especially thing but i've seen it elsewhere as well um yeah i mean it's it's almost like part of those gentrification the gentrification memes it 100 percent is yeah it's going up when the barcade hits the corner yeah game cafes in town (laughs) (laughs) yeah no like it's it's not an unreasonable premise at this point. Like everywhere, everywhere that people are living is becoming like San Francisco lights. Yes. Yes. It's everyone's getting hit harder than they've ever been hit before. 
it's freakish because when I moved to Seattle, I felt it was such a novel thing, but that was like 12 years ago. And it was, and it was already starting to get stale. Then I would say it just was novel to me as an individual. I've been, I've been watching people break down. Like, yeah. yeah. Like it doesn't seem like end time shit, but it seems like, uh, uh, there were relief valves. There were ways to respond. People can't bring themselves to anymore. Right. Uh, there is a sense of terror uh, constantly uh, as of the current moment. Uh, it's a pretty chill day to day as far as I fucking know. Uh, I'll say one <laughs> thing that I guess like is concurrent is, it is somewhat relevant to this that I wanted to give a shout out to anyway. We have a local, uh-huh. we have a local game store that is called um, so a lot of the places where I used to do all this magic shit uh-huh. Uh, was at a place called Card Kingdom. Now they ended up changing their name to Mox Boarding House because now they have several locations under that name. Mm. But Card Kingdom is in Ballard, Washington, Ballard, Seattle, and uh, is for a long time like the, this huge uh, Magic Gathering retailer on the West Coast. So people from Japan, Southeast Asia, all up and down, all I mean the U.S. as well, but there's a couple on the East that would also fill this void over there. Um, they sell magic cards like straight, like 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 they are a huge part of the secondary market. And the reason that they're able to fund board game cafes is from sales of these magic cards. It's not a direct like. I think they are starting to turn it into profitable businesses because that's the the cafes are more designed as restaurants and the whole different price structure and, and overhead and all that. The, the one you're talking about in Ballard, like it correct. served beer and food when correct. I was there. So yes. that, so that in, need is that only was, shot up. And so, yeah, you, you've been, so it was, you, you remember that was like a tiny part of the overall space, right? The, the, the space. Cafe. Yeah. There were, there was 40 yes. K stuff. There was so now, young to old range. So now, now there's one in Bellevue that's huge, like fucking enormous. And there's one in Portland. And I think they're targeting Arizona. I could be wrong about that. It might be New Mexico or something. But they're moving down west. Like they're just slowly trying to do this. And the guys who own Card Kingdom, which is still a website, the mock stuff is their restaurant. And Card Kingdom is where you go to buy magic cards. Uh, they've gotten so, 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 so wealthy off of this project of theirs. It's, it's grown over the years, right? They, they used to be just the two dudes who owned a card shop online and had the storefront. But now in Seattle, this big development has happened where uh, employees of Card Kingdom, which is to say not, I don't think, I guess this might include all Mox employees, but I know that the, the brunt of this uh, effort is through the actual card warehouse workers so these are people that are all day they're just fucking sorting magic cards and picking magic cards for all these orders that are coming in from around the world it's like a huge there's a big ass warehouse in ballard where they have invested in this they're unionizing it's kind of cool um they have independently found uh they've got with a uh what is called what ufcw i want to say this is a uh a local union that does um like basically just like store workers and uh, retail workers. Yeah, hmm. UFCW 3000 is the is the union uh, in Washington. I think I have a friend that works for them. So that might be one of the reasons that they're able to, or that they've gotten with this. But, um, you know, I just wanted to really like plug that in, in relevancy and kind of what I was, what we were talking about in general, like <laughs> it sucks a lot of this stuff. Um, but if we're going to talk about that shit, and I will bring up this one point of there's a store out here where the workers are starting to unionize for it. Um, it's funny because I think the company is so like, uh, at the end of the day, it's like, I think four people that own it, maybe like three people. And they're so right now, at least being so self seen that they're just saying like, yeah, we're going to let you guys unionize and respect your right. And they did this whole PR thing to be like, we're very neutral on this. So I'm curious to see how that goes. Um, and if anyone wants to check it out, you know, you can Google Card Kingdom Union, and it's like very easy to find information on. There's been a couple uh, articles covering it. And yeah, like those are pretty good people who, as, as, as people who are like in warehouse jobs um, and in this very niche industry, they might have a chance of actually 
doing a good union because it is so small and he's like there's not they like there's only so much pushback that this these guys can afford to do against a unionization effort so i'm very curious to see how that goes also it's it's like a union that's around like, they're handling the dead they you don't unionize all your fucking cards are going to be <laughs> missing yeah. from that warehouse no, like for sure oh, yeah, yeah. a million dollars of cards i don't give a shit i don't need to live here anymore <laughs> it's it's true like the volume they handle oh, and the stock they case. handle like magic cards that's the Ugh. insane thing aside from board games and i don't know i think there's obviously a secondary market to board games that i'll let you talk about Ruben, but like magic cards are worth money not all of them most of them are not worth money to be clear but the ones that are are worth a shit ton and so it's very like they're oof, man i'm telling you guys out there anyone i'm always saying you have a closet you have a shoe box and it is full of magic cards he sounds like a drug dealer right now it's incredible i want people i want i don't want people to throw away i'm sorry michelle i don't want people to throw away five hundred dollars i genuinely I, that's all i'm saying i don't want people to do that I actually so, no he's not a drug dealer he's Matt, matthew lesko it's the guy with the suit and all I the am. question marks on it it's free money it's, it's free, free money. money. It's free money. Read my fucking book. The book says something magic cards, dork. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> so it? true. Like I'm Show your magic cards, you fucking piece of shit. It's yeah. worth looking up, you know? It's worth looking up. That's all I'll say. That's all I'll say. Uh, oh, but yeah. I can get into the board game aftermarket real quick. It's yeah. Like, tell me about tell me about that. Cause I know some people that have like like they have like I have a little modest collection of all my cards, magic cards. I know people that have fucking board game closets that are packed to the brand. <laughs> We had to fix some shit before the cut there. Uh, board game aftermarket is kind of like books. Uh, newer editions of games, unless they have a very limited run or go viral over like at, who is it? Like Shut Up and Sit Down or The Dice Tower. If they don't like immediately review a game, uh, then it's probably not going to blow up in the market and be something that becomes rare. We only got 10,000 copies in or whatever. Um, the aftermarket is mainly like people recouping like, eh, like between anywhere from 70 to like 30% of their costs on games. And then very commonly just flipping to buying new games on site. Like you do little markets, your local board game bar I've or whatever. Seen, yeah, I've seen like swap meets. Yeah, <laughs> usually there's a, just a couple. You can find it in your area. There would just be like a couple events where a bunch of people are going to pile into either a warehouse or a board game cafe. Uh, for a couple hours and then everyone just sells the shit they don't want to play anymore and then everyone swaps around the same twenty dollars more or less um if you're looking for like how magic gathering has incredibly uh expensive cards uh like games that are out of print uh usually start to become rare and start to go up in value or if a game doesn't get a second print and then again like went viral initially and was very good or unexpectedly good like it was just them selling off the remnants of kickstarter then that could become something where, you know, people are charging three hundred dollars, five hundred percent up marks on. Oh uh, games. yeah, because like, do some Kickstarter games don't get picked up? I'd assume, or don't get reprinted ever. Correct. Usually, they get picked up nowadays. That's kind of where the money is. Is that you show you do your Kickstarter, and if you fund yourself, a lot of companies will just approach you and be like, "We'll run the production, uh, pull the Kickstarter money because we're going to use some of that for the production." And then they just cut you a deal right there to get it printed off. Okay. Then you go through fulfilling your Kickstarter people. And then, or a lot of the time, people that self-publish also self-publish, pay all their Kickstarter copies out. And they've sourced enough money to make, you know, like 20 times the stock, like 500 times the stock of what people ordered because it's just a mass, you know, it's just manufacturing from China. And they get like 20,000 right. copies in. They give out 100, 500, right. 1,000 to the people that started it. And then they have a ton of stock to sell at conventions themselves to pull in times disgusting amounts of money for cardboard and plastic. That's the thing on a lot of these, even even board games, the overhead is not that not that crazy. And the the like the uh, amount that gets charged for some of these board games is nuts. Yeah, they're definitely paying pennies on the game. I think I was quoted printer costs if I was I was looking into this maybe like like eight years ago. I was looking at like printer costs and it was something like a dollar a game in the US or five to 13 cents a game out of China. Whoa. And then like you were for just... every, for like when you say a game materially, what are we talking here? The entire box. So if you are sold Whoa. an $80 copy of Zombicide with the minis, right. that was maybe like 
not even 20 cents if they bought 20,000 units and Holy they expect moly. you expect a certain amount to get destroyed like you expect 10 to 20% of your stock to just get destroyed on transport cuz it's going to be done by ship Holy but crap. then you you either pay for this or have someone else do it you right. go uh, or you do it yourself to make it cheaper you go and you take all the broken games you're like can't sell these retail got all the parts those are replacement parts for when people email you that they're missing something so there was also there's this whole process you can also do now we're getting into how you make board games. Real quick, I'll just say, there's a fun thing about how some game makers are very dedicated to the craft and they do not involve a company. And when you pay them, they like go and live stream like, we got all the parts. And it's them building board games for like 10 hours. They sit there, uh, they sure, bag yeah. all the items, seen, put them in I the mean, box themselves. A lot of independent record labels have to do the same thing. It's like, hey, we got all these records, but we got to fucking put them in the sleeves. And so there was, like only so, only so many people are going to do that. The absolute nightmare of Mario I heard about are like hyper war game dorks. Right. Play their like games that are hyper realistic simulations or like advanced squad leader or whatever. And that's not a board game night game. That's for two nerds to kill each other uh, simulating World War II events. But the game has chits and you get like a thousand per box that represent individual units in World War II. And the dude was like, I'm not going to pay the extra money to get those pieces rounded. I'm going to buy 50. 30,000 copies of this game and he hand clipped all fucking thousand chits with a little tiny little craft corner remover one at a fucking time him and like eight family members just using hole punchers for four Damn. weeks straight um i wonder how much like, he saved on that uh apparently a good fucking amount yeah <laughs> to make it worth almost uh like two it was like two continuance months and they had every designer's family helping Jesus. Uh, and so people would come in, do like five hour shifts. This dude was doing 15 hour days for three, like three to six weeks or something. It was nuts. Um, but a- anything for your fucking, anything for the cardboard, baby. That's dedication. Um, yeah. I mean, I know that Kickstarter is one of the other reasons that board game, board games in general, like it's that, that there are so fucking many nowadays that they're just simply why, are. Why boring. we're in the niche. Once yeah. we got, uh, like once. On Carcassonne all started hitting the scene and it's like you could sell these at Target. Yeah. Kickstarters were like, you can get a game published in Kickstarter, so someone pays you or back pays you for all the work you did. You lose nothing other than showing an idea, and if it goes through, you get a bunch of money. And if a publishing deal comes through, even better, you write your ticket for making another game. And specifically with board games, it's so easy to show proof of concept, I feel like that Oh yeah, it takes minutes. It's yeah, just by the time the paper. Like the value judgment on a lot of Kickstarters, I feel like is, um, is this thing going to be good or not? I'm not certain. But if you kickstart a board game and they like show you the rules of the board game, then like it should it should be fucking clear whether or not you think it's going to be good. And like, or the, even like I don't know. Yet, yeah, the artisanal industry of the deluxe board game that has come out <laughs> in like the last oh sure. five seven years. Five yeah. Years. Well, this Starting is where to pick up more steam. this is where you take like what traditionally popular board games, but you have extremely fancy versions of them. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, you just flat out get like all wood pieces, yeah. leather or wood carrying uh, case container, uh, like every expansion ever, all built in a custom organizer, so the box holds everything. In I've seen separate oh, man. storage containers so that you can deploy the game faster when you get to a table. And, one um, one fun thing I've seen, which I'm sure is at like Gen Con, but it was at Dragon Con, is like a they had a Catan that was the size of an entire fucking table. Like the the, the oh, individual yeah. hexagons were like, I you know, a, you make a circle with your hand, and it was like that size. They were huge. Um, it was just, and they were all detailed too. They were loving. They were like, you know, they were basically painted up like uh, like Warhammer terrain. Shit like oh yeah, that. they get like hand painted minis done for it. Yeah. And it's like yeah. hundred, three hundred dollar copies of the game. Yes, yeah. Uh, I've gone in that for a couple things, but I largely think it's worth it. Uh, just because some games are like classics or something you would keep in your collection. If you're gonna play it a couple times every year anyway, right? Eh, it, it starts to become dollars on the play. Uh, you know how much time you invest in it, and it's also a different aspect to uh board games that I could also get into. Um, what is it? How do we? So have you ever hosted like a board game night event, Jake? Or you just showed up and then cream people and then told you motherfucker <laughs> until you went uh, home? Uh, I think I've like I think like I've done a creamed, few... completely uh fisted and just oh, out. okay, okay, all right, man, I I believe you. 
Fuck. <laughs> It's 1983. Get up in your I'm saying creamed, and Ruben means it in a completely 2004 way. Jesus. Shows up. Or Ruben. Shark. <laughs> no, Big I sharking do. out here. I have, a co- I have a couple games that I've wanted to do a larger game night for, but I never have. I will say in college, I did manage to get people together and play Arkham Horror a couple times and figure actually figure out how to play it. That's probably as close as I've ever gotten successfully playing games of arkham horror with multiple more than one with you know like more than once you know um which is a fine pretty interesting but like very in-depth it's like one of those four or five hour board games that like you're you're all in on that for a night with with finding people up for a co-op it's usually a pretty safe bet yeah people are into it that's very very and it's lovecrafty and you know we were all in college and very into that kind of thing and you know uh, 20 somethings and then i've had a couple like low stakes like uh experiences with i would say like uh easier card based board games like so there's one called hanabi which is just a firework based sharing game Ruben's making a face which i'm very happy about um and when that came out it was like i remember playing that with some friends um fucking god I yeah believe. oh so hanabi is a co-op game yeah you and friends have hidden information you can all look at each other's cards but you can't see your own and you need to play the cards in the correct order yes but so no one kick. can give you hints on yep. what you can play you, um, you can see each other's cards but you cannot see your own is the biggest thing to the game it has like minor hint systems built in of like you can rotate cards and get like minor clues or whatever. you yeah. can like ask a question about your hand like how many red cards do i have it's and fun you can because slowly build a picture of what your hand is because you because like it, it is asking a yes or no question to have people describe your hand to you and then you can shuffle cards around to try and ask more in-depth questions of like are my red cards on the right and get a yes or no answer or something like that yeah there's there's like i mean there's probably a, a fair bit of annoying play that can start to happen if you go really hard at that game but honestly i would say more often than not what happened was um I, I haven't done like a lot of like actual probably in the way that I, that you've done like board game nights, but I've had a lot of friends who are board game people. So I've been randomly drafted into playing the occasional board game, mostly at um, a different type of board game slash game bar that I used to work at in Seattle. That have was a ringer, like, have a ringer in the pocket, get a card game player on text. And be it's, like, need one more for board game night. It, <laughs> like, it's going to, yeah and it i mean that that goes back to what i was talking about where like um just this i have i have, I have what i call magic player brain um if you throw a rule set in front of me and you start to like and you're like hey we're gonna do this i'm i'm like cool like i'll start to i'll start to try to figure it out and you know more often than not i, I probably can can and even if i lose i'll be like cool i think i learned how to win next time and that's fun for me that's the only way i have fun with a lot of these games a lot of people really get social element um I don't know. I think where I've ended up personally is that like I said this sarcastically or like or like whatever before it's like, you know, game nights, the idea of like, oh, well, let's socialize and also play a game. It's like, you know what? I'd either I I, I would rather either try to beat all of you or have a conversation. Let's not do yeah. both at the same time. That's just gonna make it weird. Yes. That is That's a big just part gonna make it weird for me. Um, so I made a horrific face when you said Hanavi because so about five years ago when I played Hanavi, um, I was sold on it being a co-op game and like, oh, there's hidden information. I thought that'd be okay. Um, and then just playing it, I've just never thought something was less of a game in my fucking life. And I hated it more than anything. <laughs> it's really I was like, it's, yeah, it's, it's not, not a, a game. If you follow the rules, none of you are doing that. Everyone like makes faces to like show you what a card is. And at the time um i was hot i was at the end trajectory of my counter-strike competitive career so my form of competitive beast was that you should play the fucking game by the rules in the book because if you fuck with that i'm we're not playing a game anymore and we just should not do it <laughs> yeah this is and, this is equivalent to magic player brain these when are people all the same to do if you wanted to do soft bends to the rules i was like that's dog shit then then this isn't a fucking game There's you're not no fun point. with the game Oh, it was house ruled a bit. No, then fucking throw it out. Put that shit in the garbage. I won't fucking see it. <sighs> oh, my blood's boiling. <laughs> yes. I can't, I can't believe yes. it. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
It's like coffee from Robbie. It's fucking garbage. It's fucking hot shit. So okay. let me okay. try and uh, okay. No, 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 so, no. This is good. This is good. This is good. Keep about <laughs> about board game nights. How to have board game night is what we're here to kind of talk about. Because yeah, so, this is no, no, no. I have to ask now. This is like where you cut in and say what's a good one. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't have like, that ready, but all I did is see red, <laughs> and I couldn't remember anything. That's why else. I'm here. That's why I'm here. So you, we fucking fuck a knobby, right? It's not that good. What's the good ones, baby? Oh, so uh, later, a game that more or less is... It's not the same concept, but it's that idea of hidden information, is um, you can play The Mind. The Mind is a game where players uh, start off by all holding one card, and none of you can speak or communicate in any way. And you have to play the cards in order from uh, highest to lowest. Or the other way around, lowest to highest. And that's the whole game, is just staring at each other and making shifty eyes, and then put a card down and you hope it's the lowest card in the deck. So if I have a 20 and an 80, everyone's holding different cards. You got 30 and a 20, you have an 18 and a 15. And uh, you know the cards are just 1 to 100. That's the only information you all have shared. You just stare at each other until someone <laughs> slowly inches a card out, and then someone gets scared, and they put their arm up real quick at you, and you both are just holding cards. And nodding at each other like you go, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's that's great because there's no rules to tell anyone. It's shut up and put these cards yeah, in the right it's order. An extremely simple mechanic to grasp, and it also has a lot of ver like variability. And a good part of the teach of it is that you go in and just show people the first round. Hey, that's how we play it, and they win one the first round. And you're like, all right, so we got to win twelve times in a row, and every round is how many cards you're holding. So eventually we're going to hold 12 cards and put them all in order lowest to highest without talking. And um, you probably don't get that the first couple times. But it's a good it's a good thing to keep pulling out. Be really drunk. Pull it out. Do a few. Uh, it's just a good tension. It just moves a lot of emotions around the room. It's fun. Uh, something mm. that we need to talk about in board games at a certain point here. It's true. Board games, I think, are notoriously, like not actually fun um thinking of the ones that people play growing yeah. up so the i big, think the, the design... biggest being monopoly like it's not a secret that a lot of people think monopoly is trash hold up though raise a show of hands jake michelle have you played monopoly after reading the rule book yeah um probably not but i i do i do, i guess there was a time where we played electronically and i i hope that was by the rule book but maybe they also you know i still changed, think you could fudge that the electronic thing. one was just like for money and it would just yeah. build interactions for you but it wouldn't tell you what to do that was procedural um whenever i played usually starting with a friend group i usually start them with monopoly by the rules to okay. see if they will integrate into future board games or okay, if they will be the group for beer games pretend i've pretend i've never pretend i don't know monopoly by the rules so first uh step to game making a game night you need to filter your players based on what content you want to experience so monopoly by the rules every round roll the dice and move a guy and when you get to a space you buy it or it's immediately auctioned and everyone is in the auction right then the well, price everyone is except like, you is that the whole thing like you cannot auction for it i believe you can be in the auction as well because the idea is that people can then usurp you you probably i think you had to have someone set out i can't remember that part exactly i've played sure. probably three times by the rules to filter people so Sure, sure, sure. I don't keep coming back to more Monopoly. <laughs> it's, more. Just a, it's a good litmus for people to know yeah. if they will understand rules or if they will drink more and look at their phone. All right, all right. Okay, yeah. But the center of the mechanic is that there's always the auctioning. People yes. think, oh, by and large, children Monopoly is rolling a dice and buying it or saying no. And then you play for five hours when the game is supposed to be one at most because the board is immediately sold because of the auctioning phase. You right. wouldn't go around so twice before after almost one, everything's gone. Yeah, like almost after, yeah, exactly. Then the game also ends when the first person is broke. You stop immediately. Oh. And there, if you introduce any mechanics that make, the econ make money come back into the economy because mo money only leaves Monopoly. You pass, go, and collect 200. That is your only... Uh, income in the game. That's everyone's income. It's all the okay. money on the entire so board. So get that, get that fucking. Once parking, all the property's gone in two circles, here. so everyone has maybe uh, between five and zero dollars because yeah. you get up to six hundred dollars before you're losing money on every space. Now it's just downhill, which is why you want to go to jail now. 
once the properties are bought, and that's why that's such a tragedy. It doesn't make sense if you thought that Monopoly was just going in a circle and getting free money at the free parking space. All the money you've spent sits in the parking space. You land on a free parking, you get it. That's a very common house rule, and it makes the game take six hours. The economy is tight enough that you all that someone's bled dry in in less than ten ten uh, circles of the board. So that's why the trading aspect is also very important. Once you buy all the shit, you need to be moving properties as rapidly as possible and exchanging uh, quick money because your your property as you go broke. Beep, beep. And, uh, yeah, it's fucked up. People think it's bad. It's all right. Not as bad. That's actually pretty, like, I like that. I like the idea that, like, fucking <laughs> people have just been doing it wrong for a long time. And also, like, it's not that, it's not like the Monopoly is secretly a great game, but that it's like, like, everything that you think is bad about Monopoly is actually people fucking it up. <laughs> It's people and, being like, I played Monopoly part. when I was eight. Let's play it. And then yeah. they pull out the board and they just tell you what they did when they were eight. <laughs> tell you what, here's, not what the rules are. Here's one thing I want to ask about because I actually just recently did this. I played Risk and I didn't really learn it. I more played it on an electronic client that did the rules for me and I just sort of went with it. Yeah. Um, my assessment is that Risk is a bad game. Is Risk a bad game, Ruben? Mm. Mainly, yes. Mainly, okay. yes, it's pretty bad. Yeah, Ooh, it seems not take. great. It seems like it's so, very much just rolling dice and throwing your dudes around. It's just rolling dice and throwing your dudes around, and then there are two layers of strategy. The first is, who's the first person that makes a rolling ball of units that will go and take 20 territories every round, but mm. leave a country completely unguarded? And then who's the person that like actually holds borders or just tries to stay out of the ball's way and tries to redirect them or mass... It, it just becomes a weird kind of like a fighting game of like one person is going to do the ball and then they will either get dismantled by all the other players or they will be destroyed and it goes bad for them. Um, They've tried to fix risk a little bit. I think newer iterations have like they have ways to like get bonuses, generate more units, teleport units, like move people as a little surprise and give you a little resource management. But you can just not pay risk if you want to play. Yeah, they've done legacy versions, but I know that's like a whole separate so, thing because that's all, there's several legacy types of board games. That's going to have to be a different uh, episode itself is explaining how the legacy series is the game mechanic uh, about playing a game multiple times and it changes for you. Okay, uh, we, I can't well, even get into that right now. Well, we can maybe get into that towards the end, but yeah, no, no, pocket it, pocket it. Michelle has What's a raised show? hand. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was just about to say, like, I'll say this about, like, beyond the regular ones like have either of you played any of the avalon hill games like anything from that publisher i'm going to look that up Something, real quick. but i can't remember exactly but they're like mainly like war games aren't they yeah i was about to say have any of you tried stuff like battle cry yes R battle cry okay. i played the world war ii version of battle cry which is memoir 44 yeah Oh, they make access and out. So I've never played any of these games except Hero Quest, but like a long Jake. time ago. I was about to say, yeah, there's God. I do think of maybe the octagonal sort of uh, stuff. The only other thing I think of is like Hero Clicks, but oh sure, this so isn't they, that. This isn't that different from that, honestly. These are the people that make Risk Legacy that I would just that we, I just brought up. So, yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so Battle Cry is basically a hex game. Um, so it, the setting is the Civil War, and it's basically supposed to be a modular field. So it has a bunch of scenarios like First Bull Run, Antinum, Fredericksburg, uh, New Market, Gettysburg, both right. days. So a whole bunch of shit. Um, it's sort of a air quotes teaching thing. Like uh, I had it introduced to me, like I think in the latter parts of elementary school, because it was like a sort of easy to use teaching device. And also like um, it shows power differentials and how strategy was used to win certain fights. Um, and it incorporated like a certain dice values for each, uh, unit on the field. And so if you're a kid and you've played 
maybe your only other exposure to a strategy game would be something like StarCraft. So for me, I I kind of thought of, oh, higher value guy, that means I have to be strategic with where I put him. And I could like apply that flatly to other other games I'd played. Like that's kind of the fun thing about those type of board games. Like there's a competitive aspect, but also it's just like you get wrapped up in certain mechanics. Yeah. yeah. I would push into that and uh, say if you wanted to start with like war game in a lighter sense or more accessible version, like especially for family play. Um, like Valkyrie and Memoir 44 are war games that show you a historic scenario, but they break it down to all you have to do is look at like four or five cards and you pick the best command for the situation. Then that just really lets people roll into it and have uh, just a good time in general. Uh, there are a few things about it. I'm not going to talk about them because I really try not to. But uh, they, they make it simple enough to be like, hey, it's a war game, but anyone could just fucking be like, hey, pick a card up. It means move a couple dudes. Move those fucking dudes. They shoot a guy. And um, good stuff. I did like those. Did you say, I got to make sure and double check, you said a uh, school told, showed you it and made you play the game or just showed it? Oh, as like... all right. So how yeah, it was it? That how seems was it... like a pretty uh, nerdy ass board game to be given your kids. Oh, school. I think it's weird. So, it's so there's like an a... elementary school librarian, okay, who's an absolute fucking weeb. Uh, there were comics uh, on the little on a comic shop style shelf. The you know the black ones you can spin. Oh yeah, spinners. Are so oh, so spinners. So like, she had that up in uh old old ratty comics basically like donated ones and some of the stuff she had introduced was like straight up uh english dubs of animes during like i guess certain library visits and fucking what 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 else was it oh yeah uh tabletop games at a corner to be clear this librarian was out here like indoctrinating america's weebs very very weird librarian (laughs) not like bad vibes but like kind of lonely vibes i I think that's true of of, they brought they made their own board game yeah that's that's an archetype archetype, hey kids you want to play a game (laughs) so yeah she would she would basically (laughs) say we could take out however much time we had out of the library visiting hours but like we could watch something at the end if we finished grabbing our books or whatever. So that's what she did for the latter half of it. Uh, some of the kids would like nap during it, which was perfect, I think, for the teachers. So I think there was like that. But yeah, uh, she first showed me Ender's Game and then kept leaving out Battle Cry when she saw that I kept beating people at Battle Cry, which Aww. is very funny. That's oh, very yeah, no. Sweet. Yeah, no. Orson Scott Card, one of my favorite young adult authors. Boy, howdy. Man, at 33, that shit feels weird. Oh, I, good God. I mean, I'll just say that I'm, I'm I think I'm in a, I don't think I can say rare, but like I had truthfully never read any Ender's Game book growing up as a young, like, dude boy in, the, in America. Um, I mean, no, my heart goes out to the, to the people that really were into Harry Potter because fuck, man, <laughs> my favorite uh, young adult. Boy, boy, it's boy, not, have they it, aged in yeah, a weird it, fucking way. None of it has aged well. Also, shame on that librarian for not being super pumped that you're fucking whipping ass and they weren't like, this could be a general, this could be a colonel. <laughs> no, think, no, I no, think, I think that's why Ender's Game was introduced. I think they were. I think they, I think she, I think she was like, do. we would, I would, I would like you to, to command an army in the future. It will be <laughs> cool. Push you up. Hey, think about this for a little bit. You know, think a little hard about these. About Do you know game. who the Patriots are? The La Le Lu Le Lo. Bitch, what? <laughs> the uh, game but just yeah. came out. It's 2001. Yeah. Oof. But yeah, uh, in terms of that, I think having stuff like that introduced to you, and you can understand it legibly, uh, is good. Like, I'm bummed out my nieces and nephews have been introduced to games digitally first. But, I mean, they're not that different th- than me when I was a kid. Like, 
video game sure. video games in sure. terms of tabletop games i think they'll have to work backwards almost you know like it card depends. games and stuff like the shit's still super popular now that's the thing like video like i wish i could say it different or not you know i i would think naturally different but um there's plenty of people that fucking play Fortnite and then they log off and they fucking fire up uh, Hearthstone or like Magic the Gathering Arena I, or like just, something uh, like that and like turn based, card based. And it's like not that far of a leap from playing those into. Uh, just as an aside, yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. when I think of them, if they ever actually successfully do a handheld, like regular analog uh, board game or card game, uh, m- my thought would be. Something akin to, like, I want to say any sort of 52-card deck uh, game. Like, just a regular 52. We haven't, even, we haven't even talked about Poker Night or anything. Like that. Poker I mean, Night. Yeah, that's the thing, like, I mean, playing that, cards. Okay, playing that's cards. Yeah, that is phase two. I love Poker play, Night. Like. Play, playing cards are, like, it is... It, Sometimes it can be a determining factor in a friendship, like the like a fucking segment of a video game. You maybe see how far you can or can't go with this person, depending on a type of game. There's only one other type of game I could think of aside from that. Do you want to? Know it would be you, like pool. Do you want to know the most pedantic I've ever been in my life? I think. What? Okay. Uh, some friends in college, and they we would like do a thing at parties, and they would call it the speech game, and it was just drawing subjects out of a hat and having to make a speech on that subject. It's really dumb. It's a social activity. I didn't really enjoy it. It was mostly based on um, drinking, you know, and and like just doing. This. But like, I think I spent a good fifteen minutes being drunk and arguing with someone that it was fucking stupid to call it the speech game because. <laughs> It's not a fucking game, and yeah, it's not. this was like the it's height. Like... This was like the height of my like. I'm learning magic and also like be, like coming back. I probably like played at a magic tournament earlier that day or something like that, and then went to this party and was like, "What the? F- well, this is not a fucking game." But like, it, it like I felt like I I felt so weird in that moment. Like 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 truly like a freak because I was like, I'm not trying to say anything bad about it. I'm just trying to say. It's not a fucking, it's not a game. And people were like, shut up, dude. People were like, shut the fuck up, bro. Like, it doesn't, like, shut up. And I was just like, ah, like, I couldn't, you know they what I mean? Mad. Like, yeah, they were just like, they were mad because they weren't they, gamers. They, were like, they found out in that moment. They're like, oh bro, my God. Hater. And I was like, I, I think you are, I think you are gaming Larry David. Oh, <laughs> they were playing a the game. There's no choice. <laughs> in it. Did you see my arm? To be fair, to be fair, bro, to be fair. You didn't roll a dice. Fucking game. Game requires any uh, a choice, oh and that God. choice could be rolling dice, yeah. writing a speech out of a hat. There's nothing here. They Not weren't even going to score them. Not they weren't going to score them. They nope. were, they aren't yeah. ranking nope. them. Oh God! Them. It's any spreading now. No, he has. Let's it too. just say things about stuff in a hat at mm-hmm. each other. Mm-hmm. No, one sided. You just mm-hmm. say it and sit down. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! Can I just not? Can I go outside? Oh my <laughs> can I steal God! Steal everything you can own? I, can I keep drinking oh my beer? God. Oh my they God! There are two of them. Stand outside and not fucking do that. You, <laughs> you should have done that instead of being like, you know what? It's not a game. You'd my. be like, you know what? That fucking sucks. Then who wants to what go outside and smoke weed say? and make fun of these nerds? Fuck all that. Listen, what did I fucking I've, say? I've grown. Ragman. I've grown. If I were in that same scenario, <laughs> that is exactly what I would do. Like, would have walked away. All right. All right. Red well, that's button. that's my moment of pedantry. Uh, I think we want to take a small break here, and yeah. we'll get back to it in just a moment with uh, Ruben's whole game night analysis. I'm gonna grill him about what is good or bad about hosting fools, and mm. we'll be back. To bring it back in, I think we were talking. Uh-huh. Ruben was talking about vetting people for game nights. I actually wanted to directly ask, like. We talked about monopoly yes. with rules, monopoly by the rules, right? So right. once someone has successfully done that, like talk to me a little bit about uh, what, how, tell me about what game nights you've had. Let's What's just, the let's benefits just package. Do you, so like, I came in here, do you enjoy can... a game night, Ruben, or do you do it to socialize with people? Uh, yes and let's no. Let's get into it. Yeah. <laughs> Both answers are yes and no. Uh, so, uh, that was kind of like an earlier tactic or part of the process to be like, how do you hang with people? 
it, it was really just a good uh it's a general test everyone knows what monopoly is show them mm-hmm. what it is with the rules 99 percent of people are surprised at what that there's a game and what you do in it because it's not what they've seen and so that's a little fun a little party trick for you a little nerd shit but the second part is that it kind of shows you gives you a good idea of the field that you're playing with here based on what you want so what i'm looking at is if i'm doing some niche board gaming nerd shit uh spaceship fights war games anything else you gotta know the people that are really into it or up on their shit are deploying stratagems and games instead of just doing stuff and then being wackadoo um although those people have their place which is closer to like a party gaming atmosphere or what like you once you get through that litmus test the types of board game nights is generally what i enjoy or get into it's evolved over time so i'm just going to start with what I initially did, which is just planned game nights. I usually buy a new game and then tell people I'm going to play that fucking game and come to a night to play it. Or they have a new game. You're going to go to their house and you play the new game. And that's normally what a large part of the hobby is. What I don't enjoy about it anymore is that it's just playing a new fucking game almost every night if you rotate through enough groups and you never see the same game twice. Which is what a lot of people want is this fucking like bubble cum potato chips enjoyment of games of like, I'm just here to see the new shit. And as soon as you play it, that box is dirt to you, and you never want to see it again, uh, with rare exceptions. Uh, that's why I fell off. That's where the changes occurred. Uh, nowadays, uh, I technically set up poker nights, uh, more of a themed uh, and scheduled uh, sort of affairs, instead of being like, hey, we're nerds, let's do board game stuff, or let's play this specific game. Or have people bring games and kind of set up like, hey, we might play games for like six hours here. Maybe we should have like five picks. Usually board games range from light, medium, heavy. Yeah. Give them those quantifiers of like, this game's less than 30 minutes. This game is an hour or two hours. This is a six hour affair. I remember people like when I worked at a game store, I was working there more as a magic player, dude. I didn't know much about board games, but that was where I learned that people would say things like Euro style or oh, medium complexity yes. or, uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, drafting is or like deck builder or something like that, right? To describe these right. various types the broad, of games. broad common mechanics because yeah. board gaming has become more just about like theme and complexity but uh so many games are just clones or just mishmashes it's just well, like this games those three games it yeah it's another hour to play like what if this board game was this game but with x y or z mechanic also right. added to it and now we're going to call it a different game you know what if we scrubbed everything off this game you just rolled fucking dice and destroy all the rules just make right. it yahtzee theme yahtzee it works sometimes um but yeah uh it's very common for things to be like light medium heavy as a like fast chance a fast way of communicating this game's like an opener it's like a warm-up this game's like 10 20 minutes tops um like the mind i mentioned earlier yeah really draw that out and play it for like two hours if you're oddly determined or it's just like play a couple rounds and laugh and then put that shit away don't be like we have to play until we finish sit the fuck down uh (laughs) it's a little lighter than that it's a little on speed (laughs) as heavier shit it's like hey we're gonna sit down we gotta watch this 20 minute video of uh, a youtuber that does board game rules right uh, like uh Rado runs through games or something like that and then everyone watches that and you bought the game so you read the rule book days in advance looked at all the components put them into the box so that you were ready to show people how to play this fucking game i mean that's the real game night nitty gritty right there that's the that's the main i'd tool. imagine you've done that more than once I've done a lot of the teaches. I've also done some convention teaching of um, people sign up for a play of a game, which is I show them how to play yeah. in real time. Once they know I've the rules, then we finish out the rest of the game. The kids need to be taken out. Or um, if anyone's heard of King of Tokyo, I got to run the convention version of that. It's a kaiju fighting game. You just roll uh, dice yeah. to hit people or get I've or heard, buy monster powers. I've heard powers. pretty good thing. That's a Richard Garfield game, so, you know, probably pretty yeah, decent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he, he gets the around. second one's good. He made, magic, he made magic like thirty little. fucking years ago. He doesn't make that game anymore. Uh, but the convention version, they do like six foot standees and move the little Godzilla around on the floor. Yeah. Like like a 10, 10 by oh, that's fun. So it's life around. size. Yeah, I had a life size version to run in the convention. Or it's that human sized. I guess it nice, was or life like head sized. You're just throwing stacks of foam dice around. Those are always good. Um, forgot why I was talking about that. Oh, because about game complexity. Um, so usually 
when I'm saying you do the litmus earlier on Monopoly, you decide how far you want to go down that tree, and then you're trying to look for the people that are like, do you want to come play uh, this Lord of the Rings war game? And it's the entire Lord of the Rings uh, thematically, but this is going to be an eight-hour game. Yeah, that was the other one that I remember playing in college was the uh, Game of Thrones board game, which was made before the show. It was based on the fucking books, I'm pretty sure. Um, and got re like obviously when the show came out they made a version of it with all the pictures and the art from the show and all that stuff but it's like a pretty you know it is one of those four hour legit. long yeah it's, it's not bad like it's a pretty you, if i had to say interesting but interesting game to actually play more than once so that you can experience different parts of it etc yeah if i if i said you had to if you should immediately pick another game uh, after risk i would say that uh the specific like five player i think it is five to six yes player. it's like five or six um, game of thrones it's, game is yeah. the way to go it's a move people around game but it has a lot of other mechanics. it's a map yep a map game um, you know you're already smart though fuck all that go play the dune board game that shit fucking owns that oh yeah it's so tight but you so, need dorks to fucking play it dude i've heard it's good so like talk about that for a second what like what's the best like did you ever get deep into playing those types of games with 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 like equivalent you know enthusiasts like other people that would get that shit like have you played twilight imperium so no i didn't play twilight imperium I yeah played i don't another yeah, but... game similar to it i don't want right. to get imperium facts uh that it has like three versions and then they made rex it's, a version it's... where the publishers lost the copyright but just went through all their player feedback and just made a streamlined better version of their game and then they got their shit back so then they have like twilight imperium fifth edition and it's like they're still making that game but they stopped and made rex when they lost rights for a couple of years which is a near identical game but they were just like well, we just call all the bullshit everything players complain about chop all that shit off make this game take like eight hours instead of literally two days oh my god and then they have another game but whatever that's getting eh. uh right but yeah i've heard good things about that doom game and uh i've never been able to i like i can't even imagine get, having enough people locally to play a game like that um yeah it's it's hard to squeeze five nerds into a room like uh some pretty some pretty high tier nerds that's where it does get too far into like you do go to groups and then bet for their high tier players for their high rollers right and you're actually roll like together to be like, you're hey, actually guys. in a group that's like hey we all want to do this but we need to find each other um i never really i never really got that far mainly i kept it to like friend groups sure uh, they started to dabble with that I technically push someone off their like vinyl music loving cliff and push them into liking niche board games. And oh, that's what happened. That's what happened with me and magic. That's the, that was the end of my, I literally stopped buying records when I started buying cardboard. Oh, yeah. um, uh, like a, I could disease. only, I could only afford one. Like I couldn't go and I couldn't go ham on both. Um, when they got into that, they started chasing all of that, but I already, like, the high already melts it off for me of, like, I don't want more people to play games. Right. Um, and then uh, things started to diverge from what I'll call niche board gaming is that specific style of, like, this is a game about birds, and, you know, $60 cardboard that you sling for throw away because no one plays that shit anymore, you got something else to do. Um, uh, oh, uh, you said light, medium, heavy difficulty or complexity games is what kind of nerds you're looking at. Then you also have a completely different sphere of like party gaming. And uh, I'll stop off at a. You said Euro. Euro centric game design. Uh, I so, just remember hearing people talk about Euro style games. So uh, I'll, basically I'll just they address meant, that as they well. Meant, they meant you like have to Carcassonne, know. I think. They meant games that are like Carcassonne. Yeah, I mean they would they would say that, but um, fuck them for saying that. Yeah. Uh, so Euro, to be clear, Eurocentric... this was also this would have been like ten years ago. So like I don't know, like yeah, may, I don't maybe the, the language has changed. You know, the language is still the same in circles. Like games right. don't use that language, but if you said someone's like, "Would I play that?" and yeah. you know your friends like a shithead, yeah. yeah, you'd be like, "No, that's a Euro game, or that's Euro trash. You don't want any of that." Yeah, and then you point them to a Mara trash. Uh, primarily, Which I'm sure is a whole different level of like mechanical things that are. It's two. Know. It's two very easy categories. Sure, that was just like, uh, by and large, Euro games want to limit luck and create competitive environments potentially. Okay. But it's just like dry. There's not a ton of theme. It's yeah, like, we're like gonna in, farm exactly. Like, in, and if you're in, hungry, in you Catan, lose points. You just just trading. It's like, oh, we're you all just, trading. You got bricks and sheep. 
Yeah. Uh, it's all uh, Carcassonne's building a city. Yeah. Uh, but like really boring. And the coolest thing you could do is make sure someone scores less points and feels really bad that they played Carcassonne for fucking <laughs> They, they wasted their fucking time to lose a fucking, yes, um, boring but, game. Uh, and then American game designer and Ameritrash games are much more about, like, the wham pow. Uh, there's a lot of random goofy shit in this game, and, like, no game will be the same until, like, Random mechanics, plays. right. But yeah, when you introduce random elements, it's like, I want to see all the random elements you put in the box. Uh, I can play this game, like, four times, and but once I see all the cards, right. it's like, okay, I'm... Mm, yeah, let's I think move on. one of the first... One of the first, actually, alternative board games I was ever introduced to was the card game Flux. Um, which I played very early on, uh, probably when I was like 14 or 15 at Dragon Con one year. I noticed you made another pained face about Flux. Um, it's not, it's one of those games where I think it's probably, I, if I were to play it nowadays, I'd probably get very tired of it very quickly. Um, so yeah, I'll address a form of board game that doesn't exist. Uh, here's a good way to save money. When you see a game, look at it. And think how long does it take you to take index cards and pens and make it yourself? Yes. If you yeah. can do that in 10 minutes, don't buy that fucking game. <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> trash. And you're not going to play it. Uh, Flex, if anyone doesn't know, it's a game where you play a card and that card tells you what the rules are. And yeah. Play so cards the, the, the quote unquote rules of the game are constantly shifting until someone meets the criteria. You play the rules and then add win conditions and yeah. in with one of the win conditions put into the game but you can also just take a deck of index cards and see what flux is in one second and then you're like let's make up a dog shit version and be drunk too they kind of imply you should play it and be drunk all the time and i don't understand people that want to do that that i love being drunk and just definitely mindless it's meant to be a very mindless social type of activity more so than a competitive board border card game i i mean i played it in an environment where i was drinking so that was probably like a very easy way to pick it up um, like so if you were going to do that i don't understand why you would think it's fun but if you need something better to do there's a whole genre of games called dexterity games and those right. are games where you just throw shit and then that's how the game is played and they're fucking bangers 100 percent of the time please don't do something so fucking mindless like the game you draw a card and you win when the winning happens you have the winning card isn't this a game it's not, and I hate seeing it. Um, go spend a hundred dollars, buy crokinole. You just place shuffleboard in your living room all day. It's great. <laughs> There's so many other things you can do. You can play a pitch car. You just flick a car on a. You build a Hot Wheels track in your living room. You flick a car down it, and then your friends flick their cars, and you throw your car off the track. And that's incredible. And you're really drunk and high, and you're flicking your little car, and you're knocking other people's cars off the track, and you're losing your fucking mind. And then there's an advanced like... European version of Pitch Car where it's a ball with a ball inside of it so you can give it backspin and make it curve and drift around turns. Fuck everyone <laughs> that wants to do something 100% mindless. I hate you, and I hate that products exist for you. Just go stare at a wall. <laughs> Please go away. <laughs> I'm 22 right now, and I'm throwing up in my mind. I'm so angry that you brought up. <laughs> I'm so happy. I mean, I haven't played Flux since I was like 17 years old, so. Oh, it's, it's like the cards against humanity pain where people play a game that's not a game it's, in front of it, Yeah, like, I mean, we could talk about that. You're going to have to play this. I, yeah, I, I feel like that's a whole, do people still do that? Do people still, I, I think they must, love surely. own Cards Against Humanity. Uh, you know, if you ask someone they have any board games, there's a 70% chance if you don't uh, see the board games on the shelf, they have Cards Against Humanity in a drawer. Mm. and you do everything you can to avoid them taking it out no let's play uno no please anything but don't touch those that's not funny and it's not a fun time looking yeah. at cards staring at jokes and seeing if they land cards against great. humanity is uh like i you know what like i don't want to like yuck someone's you know i guess i kind of do want to yuck someone's yum like what are people getting out of that game who don't have like what am i trying to say it was a concept that you should for be a able. Day. You should be able to just trash talk people with your friends. You shouldn't need a game for that. It's fine. We're all. You can just trash talk people. And the game. The game aspect makes it weird because then you're like competing to be the most racist or the most sexist or yeah. the most homophobic. You know, it's just like it's such a fucking stupid concept. 
I'm um, soaked in sweat right now. The core of the design Michelle was Michelle <laughs> loves cards against Michelle loves cards against humanity. No. Michelle's Michelle's sitting on every cards against humanity expansion. <laughs> Michelle has the box. Ever Michelle has the box it's with just a special a card in it. It's just a series of of cards I use to cheat up my sleeve. Yeah, <laughs> you racist. bring your own custom cards that are just no. super racist. It's a yeah, royal I mean, flush. I don't think people can't be mean like i don't i don't people are like oh it's a mean-spirited game like that's fucking whatever but it's such a dumb like you can just be just go talk, just go fucking talk with your friends just dude say cuss words and slurs just to say, each other yeah, for five like, minutes for what's the problem here lord knows me and you and michelle we all do that we do that to each hold on <laughs> hold on not what i said we don't do what i said hold on <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you all no. say slurs. Both of you. We all, say appropriate just... slurs. We use ours. It's not oh, appropriation, whoa, and it's no. not racist when you use yours. Okay. It's a yeah. self-equip. It's soul bound. Yeah, it's I true. can use yeah, mine. True. I can true. use my slurs. Folks, That's she's spitting. Folks, she's spitting. So hold on. So to clarify what Jake was saying, we use slurs appropriately <laughs> with friends. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. No. No. We don't. We don't hand out live ammunition. I guess. We're not. We're, uh, <laughs> we're shooting blanks over here. It's all in good fun. And please, good God, ones. every time you can't help couple. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't help yourself. Yeah, Cards what? Against Humanity is like this weird thing where you must, if you're like, it's just, yeah, it, it's, it's not. It's, it's someone. It's not it's, like it's, you can never come up with something funny. It's you start game, playing but... and someone goes, "Huh? Do you think the N words on one of these cards?" And yeah. that's the whole experience. Yeah. <laughs> Is also, talking like, to someone that says what that. What was you? wrong with apples to apples in the first place? And apples, you know? apples ripped. It's fine. <laughs> it's part. It's you don't need to add that stupid bullshit to I it. I found yeah. the super big crate of like ten thousand apples to apples cards for like three bucks at Goodwill, mm. and I was oh, like, man. this slams. You have that's to do bad. way more work to make the word association good yes, instead of just like uh -huh, who thinks who thinks comes or butts funnier. It's actually it's harder. It's actually oh like, god, like, yeah. Like, you know brevity. You know how like brevity is the soul of wit. Like that, a hundred percent applies to apples to apples versus cards against humanity. <laughs> like, I mean, one thing I could think of. One thing we've done that uh, there's a certain type of game that does cross the line between digital and board game, and it's the Jackbox games. Oh sure, that is. I think how a lot of people have done game nights in the pandemic, Ruben most certainly. Ruben absolutely had that number. Like, there is a tendency, like, yeah, the trump card in any Jackbox game, if text is involved, inexplicably has come. Uh, it the is come done in every the come game. Is huge in Jackbox. There is, First person there. to say come, instant win. Next person to say yeah. come, still a win, but you're on thin ice. Third person to say come, you're not funny. And then two people say they come at the same time. And now it's... we all tell each other we're banned from using come. Then you wait three minutes and you say come again. <laughs> it, it becomes so arduous. The fucking mix-ups, the fucking mind fact. games of yeah. when you deploy come, when you, when you say rap mode. There's, There's just hard so many article. ways. Just the the metagame is incredible in Jackbox. It's the ceiling. It's the skill of Jackpot. Yeah, you don't have to be funny. Well, he gets you're, you're, he gets bitter even, about this. You're but... leaving out. You're leaving out that in between come. There's also dicks and like any types of any types. Uh, of there's also harsh pussy. personal callouts. There's also just describing yeah. someone yeah. <laughs> very intimate. Yeah, 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 yeah. It gets <laughs> deeply <laughs> personal out of leaving nowhere. Them lay. There's also leaving yeah, them bare. Like, trying to eviscerate your opponents <laughs> emotionally. Um, but. That's all gonna fall under like the party games category, especially with apples to right. apples I mean, and that kind of thing. Yeah, especially that. Like, no, those, uh, aren't, those, those are the werewolf. That's, that's your honestly that's your... more preferable for a board game night. Like, I would rather do that than actually sit around a board with people. You know, for yeah, the most if anyone's part gonna days. drink, immediately forget everything you're doing and just do Jackbox. Yeah, don't, don't do a board game. Incredible nerds. Don't uh, do so like a proper. I don't know. That, you know. That's step one of board game night. Don't plan board game now about people that want to drink and be on their phones. Get Jackbox. Uh, tell people to go smoke the outside and play like a three-player game. Uh, do anything but have people disinterested in playing games, play games. By God, I've had to be at too many board game nights where it is people that hear the words, this is a cool thing to do, and they're like, okay. And then they're there, and they're just shaking their heads for 30 minutes until they walk away and drink a beer. Yeah. And then you spend yeah. it, waste an hour and then try Convincing to play the game people. now. It's not. Don't, don't. Yeah. Do. Do not try to. They need to come to in. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's never gonna. It's not. It is not like Field of Dreams. 
Um, Play S tier with this one. Go find fucking nerds. Find a nerd doing nerd shit in front of you and then be like, want to play board games? Because that's what you want. You do not want someone that's like, maybe some beers and like, what I think a board game is, is not Catan. Uh, Scrabble. No, that's not really a beer game. Yahtzee, maybe. Yahtzee's good, y'all. I miss Yahtzee. Okay, I actually don't even remember the rules to Yahtzee. You have a scorecard, you roll five or six dice, and then you try to match the items you roll onto the scorecard. So it's like, how many twos? So you could choose to score your twos when you roll five twos, but if you like eliminate the category because you score nothing that round, you're effectively making poker hands out of dice. And if you roll oh, them, you okay. score them. But if you already scored that hand, you have to choose a shittier option to throw away for the future. Got like, it. You can score every number once. You can score a run. You can score a run of three numbers or a run of six numbers. And you just score the pips that you get. So it's like a it's a it's a risk reward thing of like, well, I rolled three sixes. Do I do I try and roll five sixes or do I score the sixes now? And then you can never score sixes again by themselves. So it's a little, it's a little boop, boop, boop. that's fine. That works a lot. And you don't have to own uh, 95% of... <laughs> yeah, of, that's like sorry, an that's, ancient, that's a pretty old game. But you can also not own 30% of OK games. Just you, if you just give everyone alcohol and say, guys, Yahtzee's tight. And then you yeah. just start playing Yahtzee at them really quickly. <laughs> yeah. They'll be like, all right, that's tight. Good. Um, fuck. What the fuck else did you want to know about board games? <laughs> 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 I, I'm so fucking lost. <laughs> I had notes. They're useless now. <laughs> you couldn't help yourself. The thing I was talking about Ruben. types of board game nights. So we kind of went over like yeah. how you filter people into playing all the different kinds of shit. You asked me if I play with dorks. I didn't really. And then my friends got so far I stopped playing games with them. And then my and then my uh my fucking uh sending it, my descent into darkness era began where I was like maybe board games are really bad maybe I hate playing different games because I like competitive games coming off fifteen hour fifteen hundred hours of CS:GO and trying to do something else and then I fell into traditional gaming um, taught myself mahjong I just started okay. reading card game books uh and this is where the poker night arc begins and how you plan poker night so for board game night. You got to get the right people. You need to get an audience. You need to own the right games. You need to schedule what you'll be doing in every night. You'll need to have the right audience for the right activity. It's a lot. And you need to teach everyone what the fucking do. Keep them all on the same page. Keep their attention. And that's fucking miserable after a while. And people that like it uh, only s- stop playing with normal people and only play with fucking hyper dorks that are like, I already learned the game before we got here. We all agree to watch the rules and get familiar with games before we play them, or we, you know, we will play them. Stick with people who know what they're doing and know what's going on. Um, and I fucking hated that because at a certain point you're not socializing. At a certain point you're meeting your friends for four hours, learning how to play a game for two, and then resolving that game and being like, "That was okay." And one person always doesn't have fun. One person has the most fun, and then someone's always disappointed. <laughs> And you just yeah, get a weird I would, I would imagine there's this experience of like if you're one of the person that's like always playing a new board game, like couldn't you walk away from it? I, and this maybe happens with other stuff, but like I could imagine being like, oh, here's a new board game, let's try it. And then at the end of it, just being like, what a fucking waste of five hours that was. <laughs> what if it and, sucks? Yeah, what if it sucks? I like, hated what? this. <laughs> like, what? And then you have this giant box of fucking shit that you're like, oh, I never want to play this again. Or the like how, how, how often does that happen? Right? Okay, like, so let me tell you, it happened a couple times. <laughs> and let me tell you, when my friend bought a hundred dollar game, and then I put him in the fucking paint, and he's like, this game fucking sucks. <laughs> at the end of the night. That owns. Let uh, me tell you, I am living when this motherfucker <laughs> is like, I'm done with it. This game. Oh blows. my god, you are a sicko. I fucking knew it. <laughs> and Ripping anytime that happens, I would Punisher. just start tripling down of like, no, it's really good. It's got a lot going for it. I would keep reiterating the good mechanics at him, and he'd be like, oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh, no, and it's then a, it's a good game. You just fucking suck. <laughs> then 15 minutes later, just stomp him some more, and he just goes back, just put his arms together, just get fucking bullet. <laughs> or when I'm not having fun, I wait until something bad happens to someone else, or mainly this host, uh, my friend that became an addict to board games, and I would just lean into it and be like, yeah, man, game fucking sucks, right? This sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next hour of the game where other people are like, no, I like it, or like, oh, this is cool. Like, anytime anyone has any amount of wonderment, I just scoff really hard and look over. Look at this dog shit. 
<laughs> I've a hundred percent noticed that in just even some of the board game people I've known in Seattle, where it's like you'll be like, "Oh, we're gonna play a game," and it's like, "Which one? Oh, X, Y, or Z?" And they just go, mm, "Nah, fuck that." <laughs> like there's like there's this there's a there's definitely a level of snobbery. You need a hard. You don't need you need snobbery because the number of times you will get dragged into games and actively not have fun for two hours is disgusting, and you'll believe that's something you should do or is the norm like chase the high like no actually you don't have to chase the high you walk away from any bad experience and you have a great night <laughs> no matter what you know what maybe just not the time for board games i think game. you know in thinking about my experience with board game nights that is often the case i will be invited to them or a part of them and uh what i'll tend what will tend to happen is they'll consistently continue to happen without me and i'll be fine with that <laughs> i'll be you know i'll be like okay like I went my one time, I learned that it was two and a half hours of kind of wishing I was just hanging out instead of doing this board game and then going home and being like, oh, I here's the games I like to play. And none of them involve, you know, uh, uh, hanging around with my friends. They involve playing like strangers or people who also only play those games who are not strangers, but uh, fellow right. competitors, right? Yeah. Like, and then yeah. the heel turn again, the, uh, the heel turn of... Uh, maybe board games actually suck ass because you can't socialize anymore if you have to learn the rules or if you know the rules well, yeah. now you're just playing the game as hard as you can because... and it's, i can imagine also like in those experiences it's like literally three or four hours of people quietly passing a rule book around between turns right and then trying to figure out how to take their turn or googling just... rules yeah well you and... can keep going let me look this up on board game geek find and to be... 10 other threads <laughs> to be clear if we're talking about this and that describes you like god bless you man i do tons of fucking terrible nerdy shit to you know in that, that involves not a lot of fun for my hobbies i get that um, have fun or do better it's, it's really <laughs> but yeah I, I don't know sometimes there is that element of like i mean i see this with magic players where like i haven't played magic in a couple of years because i think the game is kind of at the dumpster right now at large like writ large all types of it like all every constructed format i, I should say like drafting magic is probably always going to continue to be a pretty relatively enjoyable experience but any type of like build your own deck format to me sucks right now, almost all of them. And I know people that continue to play in those magic formats because they, they it is still fun enough to them, even though they would agree with me that the game is in a relatively bad place right now. It's almost like a Stockholm syndrome thing where it's like, it's like once you've been doing that for so long, it's like the only way you know how to have fun sort of. Or maybe when and, the game sucks, their decks are like, hey, well, my that, deck's not sure. fine right now. That can happen. No, that can absolutely happen too. Where, like, I mean, hey, God bless you. If you like playing a deck that's top tier, fucking get your money, baby. Like, go get it. Absolutely. Um, but I just think there's a lot of staleness into it. And I've seen that, I, you know, like I can imagine that happening with, hey, let's all play this new board game because everyone says it's good. But what if you don't actually like it? Because I know like Board Game Geek has a big influence on what board games get considered popular maybe less so these days but when i was working in the game store it was like if a game was popular you knew it was in the top three or four on, on board game geek no it's doubt a very good tiebreaker of like you want to spend money you're looking mm -hmm. for something to do with a group of a certain size it, right it does all the filtering for you to be like you know what mechanics you like you know what mechanics that you hate to see yeah very good at a certain point to just be it's like, kind of the only no, game get in that town. Shit out of here. right it's it's i mean to be clear board game yeah for an com, aggregate this is a website that is a large compendium of like every board game that's existed and it has reviews and all that shit of it. Um, yeah. So it is a huge resource for the stuff that we're let's talking you, it about. It also lets today. you track how many plays you do per game. You oh, say what games you own or looking to sell, what games you would buy. You can leave all these lists up publicly and you can also right. list plays per game, track them yourself and then add reviews as you play them. And then, so that you can kind of like keep a record of like, hey, I played this, I play this game once every year just because it's a classic, and then yeah. I leave my own review on how I feel changing over time. Some people really get into that side of it of like it's kind of like journaling almost to an extent of like how's this game hitting you now? How's how's your trajectory through gaming? It's yeah, it's think? similar to even like I don't know, like any type of like music or video game criticism where it's like there's Metacritic type scores and there's a list of what is considered the best and there's a canon of what is considered the best. Right, um, they're like must plays and things yeah, like that. So. All that kind of shit. Um, and I just know that the 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 active hotness, which is what they call it, uh, on their website, is always really relevant, like to what people are looking to play or what people are looking to buy. So before like they, I walk into a, 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, I was just gonna say the Dune game that you mentioned that slaps is on there, and it's still it's on there after like two years. So clearly, oh. it didn't go down. It it stayed up, stayed relevant. Looking to the Dune game, people. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it here. It's so <laughs> If you care about Dune at all, just just watch a video on how it's played. It's so good. Hell yeah. It's it's aesthetically it's aesthetically pleasing and thematically pleasing. I was gonna ask you for an actual board game recommendation, and I think we will take the Dune game as Ruben's recommendation. Uh if you're a dork, get the Dune game. If you have a hundred dollars to spend, get Crokinole, which is a short form uh, shuffleboard. Shuffleboard for a table. It does look pretty um, cool. But yeah, you need like a big thing, don't you? A big You need a pretty big table for that. And if none of these are available, the thing I'll recommend the most are a deck of playing cards. Why a deck of playing cards? You can play uh, oh, at least 15 good games with playing cards and dozens of okay games. <laughs> uh, it's everything you need in your pocket. Uh, just print out some rules in a tiny little, just print out rules on sheets. Any game, you play it once, print it out on a sheet, and just keep a little book uh, in your house, in your car. You can bust out so many fun games with playing cards. It's sick. Uh, it fits all types of environments uh, instead of the whole stretchy do you, oh, we need an opening board game to get into the mood for like a three hour game. We don't want to get too much brain burn. Uh, do, 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 people are going to be pretty tired at the end of the night though, so we got to lighten it up and get something to rile people up a little. Uh, it's too much logistics. It's too much people trying to decide what to do, what restaurant to all eat at at the same time. Uh, and it gets uh, grading after a while. Really silly. And so um, I flip to traditional games. Uh, right. There's also a pathway of people playing magic, get really fed up with magic, and start playing poker, and they realize they can make more money doing so. Way more money. And, poker. and then honestly, way less cards. Even though poker, yeah, way less. Like honestly, like poker has a lot of angles to it, but I think ultimately, like probably over, uh, overall less complex than magic. So when you ask a pro magic player versus playing poker, like it's it's a lot more to devote your life to, and it's a lot more high stakes. But the actual fundamental game you're playing, like, it, there is less overall decision making. Bluffing is certainly much more relevant in poker than Magic. But yeah, right. there's you know mechanically, once one like if you're a pro level Magic player, picking up poker should not be that difficult at all. And when you said the idea of like falling into a community, like right. that becomes all a part of it. Yes. But like once you're managing a bankroll, then we're talking about. Well, no, Magic Gathering ruins lives financially too. Oh, it uh, does. Same gamble. But, but <laughs> either is, way, yeah, no, 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 yeah, the gambling addict crossover is very real between those two games as well. Like they both involve paying money to try and win more money, hundred <laughs> percent. Shit! Before I got into Poker Nights, I wanted to mention uh, one more shout out to like deluxe board games. So sometimes there's a game that's like maybe they made for ten years. And we'll usually get a right. starter. We mentioned earlier how like they make a really nice the classics. Uh, that's something I still go into. So I would curate good pieces and i just keep like i'm trying to keep under right now i just sold off like three games Ooh, you're fading uh, so i'm trying to again. keep it oh so i you're trying to keep it under what I'm trying to keep it under like 30 games at most which oh, doesn't sure. seem like a lot but it's just like it's a, no that takes up a lot of space it takes up a lot of space it's like a full uh 10 square feet of games maybe okay i'm um, trying to think of the size of the cabinet that all of them are on yeah yeah uh, Gotta use your vertical space. But uh, whenever there's something that's just a hot ass banger and you get a deluxe board game, uh, the only thing I can enjoy now in terms of like a board game, other explaining all the shit that was before were steps you take up that I just have no time for. Uh, so now I just own really nice board games. And then when I invite people over for a game night, if it's gonna be one of those, you know, I say like, oh, I have a really nice version of Lords of Vegas. It's in a leather briefcase and it has like a, a mouse felt playing a, a mouse pad as the game board right and all the pieces are wood and 3d yeah it's like it has this like reusability to it that all the money is poker it will chips. never it will never look shitty no matter how many times you use yeah. it right like it will always yeah it will always have a uh it will get a worn aesthetic quality it'll be yeah. loved in uh, yeah. over time and that's a very nice way i think of my send off of board games is play s tier like find something that's been out really for 10 huge. years. Yeah. Buy like a nice even. chess set or a nice Go board or a nice Mahjong board table. Like the same exactly. level of investment there. Because what the main thing you're getting out of board games is touching the fucking pieces. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. At yeah, a certain yeah. point, yeah. it's just disgusting to be like, so you bought an $80 game and I'm only touching paper here, dude? Ooh, like, I, not yeah, even wood pieces in here? When there's like Gross. a game, when there's a miniatures-based game, but it's all just punch-outs, that's disappointment. 
that's like huge levels of disappointment. You want those? You want figs, man? You want some figs? Yeah. F to them. Maybe some pre-painted ones in the box. Maybe yeah. not all of them, sure. But you gotta paint fucking something, dude. You gotta give me all gray box. Um, but I also just also I also hated that. That's also another reason I got out of board gaming is I hated how many games were like a three hundred dollar Kickstarter for like right. Risk Plus Advanced Risk, and it's three hundred dollars. And yeah. I'm like, we spent three hours playing this piece of shit, and it's just shitty Risk. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, and it's unbalanced as fuck too, uh, because. The other aspect of board game night is that people are assholes. <laughs> a thing my friends started doing that I didn't look into because I just was checking out, not giving a shit. But at a certain point, he would play a game before, and then he would look up the strategies of that game and then figure out where they unbalance this game that's competitive. It's a six oh, so your, game. your friend just decided to look up how every game but you they were decided about to, to play was broken. But they decided to metagame every game that he would play, and then he would be like... Oh, oh maybe you guys want to... Well, you got to pick a faction when the game starts. Maybe you want to pick one of these. And he hands out every faction but one, and he's like, and I'll just have this one. And he, he just, just, he was just grabs playing, game mechanics for himself to take them off the table. Playing Fantasy Hustler and, like... In trying, a certain part like, of the meta, I had to start going over and stealing his factions of, like, and I'll play that one. I actually think that looks good. <laughs> I'd take it out of his hands and yeah. then hand him the other ones <laughs> and tell... Extremely and obnoxious. To just steal game pieces. Ugh, dickhead, dickhead, dickhead. Or if I saw in the middle of the game that that's what he's done, because like you will mention, like, oh, we played this three times before, I would just start iterating on what his army can do that is like the broken combo in the game. Or yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like, here's games. here's what's funny. It's like figuring that out in the moment. Like that's why I would play a board game. It's fun to literally try to play a board game and figure. But it's like like looking it up beforehand is just that's. I mean, I wouldn't say it's cheating, but it is like. Tant, it's very close to uh, uh, the playing spirit, it several times the and then spirit. getting new players in, and then the spirit of the game yeah. is that you move to make sure you win. Yeah, uh, it's like, like that, evil is, that is spiritually cheating. It maybe isn't cheating in the regard that you're stealing anyone's money or anything like that, but like stealing come on. time, you're stealing something much yeah, more valuable. That's fucking instantly, that's fucking, so that's just obnoxious. Like that is <sighs> that is a uh, uh, not gamer like behavior. I'll I don't say play that. <laughs> so this is how you play a game, might. Don't play board games. I know um, this has please. been a funny episode because we really wanted to talk about the aspects of actually planning a game night and like hosting people and like the elements of like the work that you have to put into it to do it yourself. And we kind of just started talking about how like fucking board games aren't that cool at all, which, I, get there, which is fine. I, uh, to be clear, I'm okay with that. But <laughs> I think I think of my ideal platonic idea of like a board game night working out. It's incorporated into a different part of the party. It's the after party or nightcap part of the party. If right. you show up and the the destination is board games, you're already doomed to fail. Yeah, it it should be incorporated like, into a dinner party. Can I, can I, can I, if you show up and the destination is board games, you're probably in the Pacific Northwest and it's probably some sort of polyamory gathering. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, no. If, if, if it starts with board games, it's some dark shit's going to go down at some point or another. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry to anyone in our audience that actually loves board games. No, I no, I, I, fuck them. No, <laughs> it all burned. <laughs> no, you know, no, because I know what y'all showed up there for, and it was, it, it was not Netrunner. That's all I'm fucking saying. I'm sorry. Don't get Ruben started on Netrunner. Don't, I won't get Ruben started on Netrunner. I'm just saying. I can't like, hate it. It's a cool. It's a cool game. It's a Richard Garfield banger. Po polyamory board game uh, <laughs> dynamics, much like charcuterie. How much of it is true? How much of it is exaggerated? I can't <laughs> say. I can say anecdotally, the experiences that I've seen are when you could tell when a bunch of people in a room have fucked one another, <laughs> depending on their hand holding habits. During um, playing board games, and I fucking uh, hate that about the Pacific Northwest. I see it, and I feel like I've been told a dark secret, and I don't like it. I don't but like they it do either. it. They just do it in front of you. Why no are you PDA. holding your hand like no that? No PDA. 
No PDA game night. It's not late enough. I walk in the door. I've had not one beverage, not one soft drink, and you're fucking holding hands. I'm gonna throw up. Oh no, no. If they if they do the side hug where they're hip to hip, uh, uh, regardless of gender, you're just like, well, what's up? Here. What, what are you did, fucking did, on the I, table? Did, get did I here. not get a memo in the fucking email or the group chat that this was something I didn't know it was going to be? What's going on here? That's, you're very familiar, and it's interesting, whatever, but I didn't sign up for this shit, man. Well, uh, like, do you play tug? Do they play tug of war a lot or Twister? No, no. Oh, no. No. Is ever... no, it is not. It wasn't they 1996 not. at the time, Ruben. No. Uh, Tug of War is fun. Be that as it may, Tug it was War, inside. Tug of War is like a fucking outdoor, like, like sports Physical activity. activity. It's not a board game. It's not a game night if, thing. Like you can really con- surprise people by owning a length of rope what, knots like, in it. If you, imagine, like if it if happened... went, imagine if you went into someone's apartment and they had like cleared all the furniture out and you showed up, <laughs> you showed up, you showed up for game night. And they, we kill it. They, we they, kill it. They were like, "Hey, bro. Okay, here's the rope." Here's where's the, the plastic? Where's the plastic tarp? Who Whose design is this? Yeah, we're all playing tug of war in my. Wash your hands. You better wash your hands. Like, what? It's a tug of war of a sort, I guess. All right, did everyone get a hot dog. All right, finish no. up. Wash your hands. Shut we're the fuck up, Ruben. <laughs> Shut the fuck. Uh, oh man, yeah, no, a dinner party ideally is it accompanied by I don't know some some nice light music yeah uh having music on pop music pop music or something ambient electronic is always nice just because everyone's heads like in the game they're laughing they're they're telling stories because of the backing of the music there's a little bit more ease a lot of people drink or or smoke weed uh I smoke cigarettes less in this type of activity or whatever, but when people do, they have like conversations for 20 minutes and burn through like two or three cigarettes. Uh, that is like my ideal if it, because it's incorporated into a thing I enjoy already versus it being forced. There's always some sort of physical game. The last time I was at a party before COVID I was at a place called the Dyke Ranch. Uh, where a bunch of lesbians were arm wrestling with one of the lesbian straight mothers. Like, that was where games begin, begun and ended, and maybe four sets of college kids uh, were playing some sort of uh, Pictionary-esque game. Uh, but pretty much everyone diverged from that when lesbian arm wrestling started. You had to be there sort seems, of thing. Yeah, that seems like the whole that seems like something the whole bar should get in on as far as a yeah. new experience. Impromptu arm wrestling tournament is always a very That's good fucking dope. party's atmosphere. Yeah, cuz it's like the, get your fucking guns out. Get these Just like n- cuz it's not even machismo at that point. It's just like yeah, it's like some sort of shonen thing. They're just fucking it's, testing each other's strength and other power might. levels. You know what? It's we need a quick tourney here. Let's uh, shit. let's run up some brackets real quick. Yeah, like Samantha, look at this bitch. Here. Look at how long her arms are. Oh God, bomb she will four, challenge the, the mother. The, yeah, the mother took out six. The mother took out six six college kids. She fucking laid those girls out. It was hilarious. She's just like looking at them and not blinking, just doing one of the like, like imagine the pendulum just completely like, but quickly moving down. Like that was her. <laughs> she was just like Darth Vader. <laughs> like this is happening. What do you want from me? I'm sorry. Kids too. Fuck. I worked on a. Kids. I'm on a. Yeah. No. She like clearly worked on a farm. Not the young. <laughs> she was just like smiling the whole time. Like, what do you, What do you think? What do you think? Oh man, fantastic! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Bygone time. Yeah. Now it's it's oof. you know the whole thing with and I wanted to also mention like the whole thing with a game night in these in this day and age is that it is still something you can do that doesn't um completely fucking suck with regards to spreading the COVID nineteen virus. Um, you can have people that you know are 
uh, who have been safely isolated. You can have people who have been safely distanced. You can all meet and play a game outside or within a fucking ventilated room or environment that it's like, it's still just relatively versus going to something like a big concert or a big tournament, which is like what I used to do. It's really unfortunate because like that stuff's starting to happen again. And there's a part of me that itch. It's like, Oh man, like I really did used to do it a lot before the pandemic. And yeah. I think about going back to it. And even in today's circumstances, I can't hundred, I, I can't make the argument that it's actually safe. It's just always a gamble. It's just always a fucking risk. So there's something that's on the lighter end of that is just like, it's like getting together with friends, like just a smaller group of people and fucking not um, completely blowing up your chances of getting COVID in the second year of the yep. pandemic. <laughs> the I mean, I'll say this. Uh, you have to be selective about when you engage with that or not. Like absolutely, yeah. That's people I mean. are people are in limited ways going back to our life. Myself, I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm in that same boat. Like I'm, I'm, I, I'm slowly doing some things that sort of are like what I used to do. Yeah, the this show's sort of existence is sort of spurred out of all of us. Uh, yeah, absolutely. you know, working again slash also pursuing our individual interests yeah and like me i'm like dating again like i'm moving yeah. things forward in my life yeah so that means like yeah in some cases in person meeting or whatever where like god for a year and a half it was like a massive taboo like sure, a sure. lot of interpersonal shit yeah so i mean in limited instances i i feel uh, limited interactions with friends uh where you're, you're at least vocal about what you do like uh for for me for example the the place i work at uh, i won't name it specifically but like i would i would be hesitant to to go to large gatherings without getting tested first yeah. just because of the nature of my work sure. and then also like uh pfft, being a a polite slash you know just being a being like a genuine citizen in the area you live in like you want you can't obviously accommodate absolutely everything 100 percent of the time uh and be 100 percent cognizant of everything just 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 there's just so much someone does within the day but you can be prepared and like uh be conscious and you know abide by uh decent standards some of them are like melting away right now and it's of a big concern uh conventions are opening up again as was mentioned earlier uh and yeah, there was just a thing where anime expo said they were going to drop all of their covid and mask protocols and within like 24 hours had to retract it and when the say, refund map yeah the refund they... window was up they uh, actually, said, anyone could actually, show up. Um, yeah, I guess I guess people started refunding. Is that what really do you think that's what really prompted it? It was like I, just I think they, they waited till last minute to prevent like a mass refund. Oh, my God. So, yeah, people have hotels in the hotel's not going to give it to right. you now. Travel but, plans. But like to be clear, they've already reversed it and said, actually, we're going to require testing. Actually, we're going to because people like fucking I don't know. Also, fucking mine. Yeah, I'm putting three thousand dollars now. Like I can't not come across the country now. I'll come over there and just set the place on fire. Fuck. And not <laughs> yeah. and not just that. It's it's conventions have had like uh, staff tolls now, um, and yeah. you know visitor tolls. So totally. yeah, it's. I mean, people are still going to do what they're going to do. You know, uh, I I can't change individual policy. I I could say yeah. I'm sure Coachella and fucking uh, bu, bu, God, what was that other one that was happening recently? Um, like PAX or something like that. Yeah. Like shit, like PAX like, South, I think happened. PAX South. South uh, God, South by Southwest. They're st they were doing oh, South yeah. by yes. Southwest. That's correct. Yes, yes, like yes. still happening. In pretty much, pretty much everyone has has given up the. Uh, because everyone's misappropriating this term now, the harm reduction model of of yes. trying to continue pre-COVID businesses as they'd run run before. Uh, yes. No matter what, if 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 you are going to do this now, and you just 
completely only go by the state's rule sets, then you, you're playing a game of the way out is through like, okay, is there a risk of you being a body count of our convention? Yes. Oh, yeah, However, we still have the swag bag. A, you still get to be Lou Ferrigno. Uh, everything, to be clear, like every, like fucking most social activities in America now are just that much more of a die roll. And yeah. it doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem like it's going to change. So people's individual level of comfort with that is what's important to consider here. Because yeah. I'm not going to fucking blame anyone as long as they don't pretend like what they're doing isn't, you know, is is a hundred percent sacrosanct, right? Like, like it's like we all can be, we all can understand that the decisions that we have to make are are ours like individually, right? Like, I've certainly oh, yeah. I've traveled cross country during the pandemic because I've had to. I've done a couple things that wouldn't be considered necessarily great because I've had to. It's fine. That doesn't mean I'm a fucking terrible, you know, lived person. Oh yeah, but no. This is all I... just in the interest of like of like emphasizing like comfort in this uh, and emphasizing like shit that people like to do. That, that is like that doesn't yeah that doesn't trigger that anxiety either you know what i mean i mean yeah no that's it's the fine line like yeah yeah like it's just i feel like yeah this this is i can reconcile this a little more easier now than like mass events even god uh special olympics actually folded on this recently uh like desantis basically demanded uh rec- like uh removing the mask mandate around the population of people with some of the highest comorbidities uh that can be uh adversely affected <laughs> or can have adverse effects with contracting covid-19 especially the newer variants it's fucking wild uh whew. yeah uh that said uh wanna... ruben you were saying I don't want to say everything goes back to camping, but if I could make recommendations for activities, I've been enjoying camping gear, and that gear becomes day trip gear, and folding tables then become gaming tables. Play games near the trees. It's fun. You bring your friends. Go buy a folding table. Uh, that's all I got. <laughs> Just outdoors. That's fair. Just go outdoors. Ultimate Do a lot lesson. of shit outdoors. Be pretty good. People have gotten COVID from being outdoors. Don't go outdoors with every random person on the fucking planet but i think if i ever have played with like a playing deck of cards like it rips uh, an un an un an unreal amount of that has been like around a fire or drinking around a picnic table by playing uh, a good one late at night play uh before getting playing cards of poker night Try playing around one candle, only light source. Share a light source where you try to look at your cards, but everyone else leans in too, so you're all trying to sneak peeks at each other's cards while using the only candle at the table to read. Fun. Fun stuff. Outside. Being very drunk and playing bullshit. I mean, bullshit's good. Oh, yeah, hell's bullshit's good. a classic. Bullshit's a classic. Solitaire. Go play multiplayer or solitaire if you have a deck of playing cards. I I don't want to know about that. It's sicko mode. Live action. It's everyone's playing their own game of solitaire, but the field where you draw and discard is live. So you're just bam, bam, bam. You make your rows, and then you grab cards that people are trying to get rid of, and then you make you make your other. This sounds rows. this sounds like a polyamory thing again. I, yeah, I'm it's not like gonna free lie. Cell. It's I'm like sorry, solid, dog. but you put your keys in the bowl and then we go camp. <laughs> that no, is it. Okay, okay. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh my god, he say it. Uh yeah. So, how to play how to host a game night. <laughs> First of all, um, you take everything we said into consideration and you decide to play poker instead. But Ooh. poker may not be the best game for everyone. There are different styles that suit a lot of people. So what you may want to play is dealer's choice. The person that has the deck and deals it picks any game they can teach with cards. And if you feel like it, put stakes behind it. Have everyone put in a dollar. Give people 100 chips, any chips. Just have them play any game. Nickel poker. Some people Uh, play. Oh, yeah, you can go up to nickel. I would say go penny because it's the larger. Yeah, penny or nickel. like to see. You want people to push a lot of chips. You want to own a lot of chips. You want people pushing them all the time. You don't want that to cost five, ten bucks for all in. He's, uh, he's going games. in for all the nickels. Do dollar games, make a penny, ten chips, so that people have thousand stacks, and so you can be like, fuck it, and you just shit them on the <laughs> table. Because that's what you want to happen. Um, 
So with Poker Night, you also have the choice of doing dealer's choice, like I said. People can bring their own games they know. They get to teach games. You can just pick Go Fish to be a fuckhead and just be like, hey, fuck it. Go Fish for 50 cents. Winner, it's, winner take all. It's kind of like Mario Party, but with a deck of cards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but they're actually skill-based games when you're playing. <laughs> well, sure. Some Mario uh, Party games are skill-based. All of it isn't, which disqualifies it. We don't have time to talk about Mario Party Chain. <laughs> I don't want to talk about Mario Party Chain. I just said it's kind of like. That's it. Yeah. Uh, so, then you usually pick some snacks. Uh, I usually cook. I make a big pot of curry. I just tell people when to get a spoon. Um, buy poker chips. They shouldn't be more than a nickel per chip. Uh, that would be kind of expensive. You can find them on sale online. Um, yeah. It's a very good time. It's very universal. You don't have to vet people for their ability to understand. Most people understand, put the money up, bigger card win. Um, and that's how I recommend to do it from now on. Um, fuck board games. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Well, we've come so far. Yeah, we've, we've but come I'm, so but, far, but, folks. But, but I will say, I think we figured it out. Mm -hmm. Games are bad. Poker's Games good. are good. It's just like context. I think, yeah. Uh, I think we've, I think we've arrived at several answers that could be adequate. Okay, about... you're correct, Michelle, that there's context. But Jake is coming up to the point that is also correct in that um, there's a way to have fun and there's a way to be a fucking loser and a dork. And yeah. Stop it. And it's, just really just oh. about, it's about figuring out if, if you have fun doing one thing or the other oh, and making sure that you surround yourself with people who think yeah. the same. And if you don't like get a good experience out of it, sometimes I found that it's a great people watching activity. You can identify. That's what I, that's what I end up you doing. You can identify, like, maybe. Out. Yeah. Here's the guy that's going to get pendantic about the rules. Uh, what does that say about him normally? Uh, I, heartily, I heartily endorse showing up to a board game night. Don't be invested. Refuse to play games. Drink and stand near them. Yell out all of your opinions of the players and what's happening the entire time. Oh my god, yeah, no. It's like you get to live Jim Carrey's Liar Liar for real. The game's about you now. <laughs> You're the game. Yeah, the you are. Goes bad. You're fucked up for that. What the fuck, Paul? He's got an ace. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I got people's cards. So good. <laughs> What? Why, dude? Number Why? One. That's not, that's not even commentary. You just Number tell me to cheat. <laughs> just tell people what, yeah, just yell out your, your friend's cards. Help people cheat. Try and get people to pay you to cheat. It's fucking sick. Play the it real would be game. really fucked up if the river had a flush right now. <laughs> ah! <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, sports. Yeah, spectating, I think. As a player, you're completely eating shit the whole time. Uh, it, it's it it's nice to learn about your friends. Also, like I think a lot of who, what someone's values are, or like how they like to have fun. Absolutely, for me, at the end of the day, uh, whether it be you know Jake's, uh, as we've heard, learned, like Jake is the competitive guy, Ruben. Ruben likes the whole experience. Uh, there's a that that means he values coziness on some level a little differently than you or I. Uh, and for me, yeah, I I love interpersonal re interactions and then seeing those outcomes and what it, you know, obviously not armchair doctor shit, but just it's it's nice to learn someone's air quote tells in any game and what. What are yours? That's like an interesting thing to think about what you bring to a group of people. Uh, I know what I bring to this group of people. I am Michelle Perez. Uh, that is Jake. That is Ruben. And this has been the Pig Iron Podcast. Uh, take it easy, everyone. Remember to rate us, review us, everything on all platforms that we are on. Apple, Spotify, all that good stuff. Take it easy. Have a great night. Yeah, if you'd like us, tell your friends. Absolutely. Or your enemies. Yeah.